What is your Twitter, Twitter, Twitter name? Jennifer uh, tweeted it as well. Okay, so Dave, are we good with uh, Dale's video? Uh, let's, yeah, okay, you ready? Yep. So if you want to do the introduction, go ahead. Okay, I'd just like to introduce Dale Eck, who is the uh, director of the Global Forecast Center uh, at the Weather Channel. Uh, hang on, we're locked up here for a second. Okay. Three, two, one. All right, let's take it from the top and go. We'll go to the coast. Oh, go ahead, just play the video. You're good. <clears throat> yeah, we'll get them all. We'll get them. <clears throat> and that'll come up on this monitor. Right I'm there. Dale Leck. I'm the director of our Global Forecast Center here at the Weather Channel. I've been here 25 years. I started out as an on-camera meteorologist and coming out of Penn State University with my bachelor's degree. And I've seen a lot of extreme weather over the past 25 years. What got me into meteorology, I love snow, but through the years I've seen plenty of severe weather outbreaks, flooding events, as well as hurricanes, and all of those weather phenomena really grabbed my interest, including the extremes in temperature as well. This week, I'm going to be leading each day by giving a weather briefing so all of us can interact on what weather we expect over the next several days out to 10 days and how the weather might affect us here in Breckenridge, Colorado, and I hope it is plenty of snow. I'm Dr. Greg Forbes. I've been severe weather expert here at the Weather Channel now for more than 12 years, but I've known Dale Eck longer than that. I was on the faculty at Penn State Department of Meteorology previously. He was a student of mine, an excellent forecaster then, an excellent forecaster now. In fact, he heads up our Global Forecast Center. That's the group of meteorologists behind the scenes that use computers and then their experience to mold our forecast that you see on weather.com and on the air. So we're glad to have him at the Weather Channel and we're glad to have him here. Simplicity to take us through this. Starting off with the satellite this morning, um, relatively quiet across the north. Uh, our biggest feature is this storm in Texas. That's going to produce a lot of rain and even some snow pretty far to the south. A little bit of a clipper here. It's producing rain in northern Michigan. The story of this winter so far up in the UP, it is snowing. And there is another weak front that's moving into the northwest. May play a role in the weather here as we head on into uh, maybe Wednesday, Wednesday night. Look at the radar showing that little clipper across the north. A little bit of light rain showers around the Puget Sound, but the bulk of the moisture here associated with our southern system, and you see more and more blue on there. We're getting a little more snow and could get some pretty decent accumulations. And they're getting some welcome rain in Texas, which is uh, definitely a good thing there. Um, let's go ahead to... Uh, kind of will step through what's going on. So the biggest feature, as you can see, the frontal system across the south. A lot of mild air with that. Fog's been a problem the last few days. The rain is picking up in Texas, and the snow from west Texas down toward near El Paso. So that's uh, some of our major features. Most of the north is pretty quiet right now. And this is early morning. Temperatures are barely below freezing. Uh, some of the interior west is. Uh, it just continues to be mild across most of the country as it has most of this winter. And these are the forecast highs for today. Look at that. Hardly anybody staying below freezing except where we're getting that snow in the southwest and in northern New England where they will be getting a little bit of snow. But to put it in perspective, that's compared to average for just about the whole country. Continues to be above average except for uh, the southwest. Uh, here's a look at the forecast model um, for this evening. Uh, low pressure down across the Gulf Coast states. Uh, the low mainly in the Gulf, but we may get a little bit of severe down here right along the immediate Texas coast. Rain, a lot of it across the lower plains, and then a little bit of snow in west Texas. And there's our front pushing into the northwest, and that may play a role in our forecast. And there is some chilly air right now up in northern New England. Uh, this is going into tomorrow morning, the low tracking right near the Gulf Coast states. So again, a lot of rain in Texas, Louisiana, and across the Gulf Coast states, and south and near the low, maybe looking at some severe weather right along the immediate Gulf into southern Louisiana, and then spreading toward the uh, Florida Panhandle as we head on through Tuesday. Our northwest system starting to fall apart a little bit, 
and temperatures you can see the zero line at 850 well removed from this system so once it gets out of uh, West Texas, it's going to be just pretty much a rain producer as it makes its way east. Here's a look at the forecast for snow. So nice little snowstorm for West Texas, some places in the north. Wish that would happen, I'm sure, but um, up to about five to eight inches at Midland forecast. That's by the uh, our Global Forecast Center at the Weather Channel, and then you can see uh, the copious amounts of rain to the east. Um, tracking the low as we go on through um, then tonight and tomorrow, the low moving on up into the Gulf Coast states. Plenty of rain along the immediate Gulf with some thunderstorms and a few severe storms are possible. Notice our Pacific system coming over the ridge. It's going to be dropping down through the Rockies, but typically those north-south systems don't bring a lot of snow as you don't really get the fetch of, oops, sorry, moisture coming in off the uh, Pacific there. And as far as the severe goes, here's a look at... Uh, SPC's outlook for today, slight risk. They've got about a 15% chance of some uh, hail and wind. 5%. Yeah, there's been some local tornadoes I saw. There were some warnings out. And then tomorrow, as that low lifts across uh, the Gulf Coast states, some locally severe weather. I guess Dr. Forbes' Torcon is at about a 3 or 4. The system's... Yeah. Some severe far up there. So anyway, there will be some severe. It's not a, you know, this time of year, climatologically, it's difficult unless you get a real crashing potent system. So this one has the moisture, but, uh, you know, the instability is not terrific. Um, then looking ahead, again, this storm system as we go forward, notice how it is really disjointed from the cold air. So rain through the Tennessee Valley. Uh, this is heading, let's see, that's 12Z, that's Wednesday morning. And then by Wednesday evening, you got your low pressure system coming on up into the mid-Atlantic. Again, this is all going to be rain except for maybe northern New England eventually. Uh, taking note here of the little bit of moisture printed out here across uh, Colorado, we'll take a little closer look at that. But while there will be some severe, there won't be any snow with this storm. And as it moves on through, the big story here is going to be the rain amounts. We're looking at locally up to three to four inches of rain from cent uh, north central east Texas, through Louisiana and up into the Gulf Coast states, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi, and even some pretty good amounts as you head on up into the mid-Atlantic region, pretty large area of one inch, and locally we'll get some areas of uh, two or three inches of rain. Uh, again, a little bit of moisture printed out here across Colorado. Well, what I like to do for this area of Colorado is look at the 700 millibar flow and the relative humidities. Here's uh, Saturday, uh, Wednesday morning. There's the disturbance dropping on down, but again, it's moving north to south. You're not getting any Pacific moisture into this system, so it's just kind of some upper level, level dynamics. We'll try to squeeze out what it can as it moves its way to the south as we go on into Wednesday morning. And this is oh, SPC's forecast for a probability of four inches or more. So they're only talking about 10%. So now I, I think that's a pretty good forecast too. Probably not going to amount to all that much. Um, as we continue on through the week, this is looking out to, uh, what are, where are we here, 13th? Uh, that's, what, Thursday afternoon. Uh, the lows moving out through New England. Uh, there will be a pretty good cold shot here, but compared to what was advertised last week, again, this one's not going to really live up to uh, much of its hype. We're probably only looking at minus 10 to maybe a little minus 20 air getting involved in this thing. And eventually, uh, with the actual front itself, it may start to squeeze out a little bit of uh, snow in the interior northeast, maybe the Poconos, Catskills, up on into the mountains of New England. But for most of the rest of the country, as we head on through, uh, this is um, Friday morning, uh, it looks generally dry for most of the country. And that, again, the cold behind this thing, minus 10 air at 850, that may bring it back to normal. That's about it. It just isn't getting cold across the lower 48 this winter so far to speak of. Um, looking ahead, this is uh, for Friday evening and then on into Saturday midday. Once again, we're going to get another low uh, developing down across the southwest. So, you know, Texas and the big drought they've been in all of this year, they've gotten some nice wet systems so far as we've gone through the uh, winter season. And it looks like that trend is going to continue with just some near normal air across the northern tier of the country. And then it looks like that low as we head through the weekend, mainly tracking along the immediate gulf. And then behind that, nothing big, but uh, 
pretty good system there up on into British Columbia, but that's where they've been heading all winter, so we'll see what happens after that. So again, the big stories are the snow in West Texas, a lot of rain and maybe some severe along the Gulf, and just again, not much snow, and we may get a little bit here Wednesday, Wednesday night, maybe a couple of inches, but that looks to be about it. Okay? No questions? <coughs> All right. Try to keep us on time. So. One question, what? One does not believe. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, so what we're... Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to switch computers because Dale's going to use his every morning for the briefing. I'll bring mine up here, uh, but I did want to introduce uh, Don Burgess. Don is going to give yeah. um, a like presentation one to Dr. Forbes on there. a dual Thanks. polarized Doppler radar. And uh, as you know, dual pole is really uh, uh, being spread out and installed throughout the U.S. now with uh, all the Doppler radars, and that's going to give us quite a bit of uh, uh, capability. And so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Don's uh, little introductory video on uh, where Don is from, and that's the NSSL, National Severe Storms Lab, in Norman, Oklahoma. So as you take a look at that, I'll set up my uh, computer for uh, Don's presentation. The NEXRAD radars stand tall, scanning our skies. They are components of a national also, network are, maintained uh, by the Radar well, Operations well, Center. The information provided by these radars is used by NOAA National Weather Service forecasters, the Federal Aviation Administration, and U.S. military. Forecasters at the NOAA National Weather Service use NEXRAD radar as their primary tool for observing, monitoring, and forecasting the weather. The Radar Operations Center plays a crucial role in supporting the forecasters' day-to-day -day operations. Well, in the short term, the support role of the Radar Operations Center helps us keep the radars running reliably. And in the longer term, the development and modernization efforts that go on there help move the technology forward, which then allows us to do more. The NOAA National Severe Storms Lab researches and develops new tools and techniques to improve the radar. Once proven, these new tools must be placed in the hands of the forecaster. So the Radar Operations Center is responsible for taking that research technology and implementing it on the, the national network. Uh, without them in the, the process, the research techniques that we develop here stay here. They don't make it into the operational system. And so the, the Radar Operations Center is an important uh, part of that process to make sure that things that we identify here are implemented in the operational network so all the forecasters have the benefit of it. The NEXRAD program was uh, uh, a collaboration of, of three departments, Department of Transportation, Department of Defense, and Department of Commerce. Working together, they could fund this network of radars uh, in a more economical way than each of the agencies could on their own. They also formed this uh, radar operation center with uh, tri-agency staffing and funding. In 1988, the center was established in Norman, Oklahoma. The location was based on its proximity to the National Severe Storms Lab and the University of Oklahoma's Radar Meteorology Program. The work done by the Radar Operations Center requires a wide variety of specialties, including meteorology, engineering, programming, radar technology, and many others. A 24-hour hotline 
provides assistance to radar field sites across the country, as well as some international locations. Technicians also travel to radar sites, providing assistance for maintenance and support activities. Currently, the Radar Operations Center is collaborating on a major improvement to the radar network. Dual polarization technology allows the radar to send and receive both horizontal and vertical pulses. This simultaneous signal will give more information about the size and shape of particles in the atmosphere. So overall, what, what dual pole is going to do is it's going to allow the forecaster to be more accurate and be more precise with, with their forecast. They're going to know when it's going to hail and where it's going to hail. They're going to know when the, the wintertime precipitation is going to be light rain versus heavy rain versus snow. And the difference between six inches of snow or maybe a half an inch of rain is, is just huge. That'll allow the forecasters uh, to say which of those scenarios is going to occur. Emergency managers then uh, are able to put salt on the roads or not. And so it's really going to make the public a lot safer from that aspect as well. Acting as the bridge between research and warnings, the mission of the Radar Operations Center is vital to our nation's weather safety. The number one goal is to keep this fleet of radars running at a very high availability rate to provide reliable data and high quality data needed by the forecasters to put out warnings for severe weather and tornadoes. be here and to talk to you. Uh, seeing that video, you see that I get to work with a lot of smart people and doing interesting things with radar. But you know, there's a component of that that I'm going to talk about today, and, and I'll call it weather propaganda. We have these new systems, and we advertise them, and they have great potential. But what I'm going to talk about today, a lot of it, is the nuts and bolts of how we make it work. And for an upgrade like dual polarization, it's on its way. We're going to field it. We are fielding it. But it's still got work that has to be done to realize those potentials that we just heard mentioned. I'm sure you maybe realize that already, but maybe I can put a little meat on the bones of those statements. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, some of this talk is going to be redundant with a very similar talk that I gave last year, except another year has transpired and we've had more adventures. But I wanted to start with an introduction because not everyone here today was here last year when I talked. And for those of you that are new in particular, you should know that all the materials that I've, or <coughs> most of the materials that I've stolen, I, I've stolen different amounts from different places, but, but a lot of the materials come from the training branch that's right in Norman. Paul Schlotter, my cohort in this dual poll presentation and one of the smart guys is going to talk after the break, uh, help put all this together. And the dual pole training materials on the web are all very good and very useful. And I encourage you to look at them if you're interested and want to see more detail. Some of the same slides I'm showing today are in those materials. Well, we've, we've had a lot of introduction to dual pole. I used to start at the beginning and say, you know, we sent out signals, pulses that were horizontally polarized. And now we want to think about vertical polarization. Well, so what? I, I think everyone has heard something about it now. So we can go a little more quickly, go a little further. And looking on the left, the simplest way to think about dual polarization is you transmit pulses horizontally, then you receive them, then you transmit vertically, you wait, listen, receive those. And if you're doing that with the horizontal pulses, you can see information, uh, gives you horizontal dimension of precipitation particles or information about that. And then with the vertical component, you can map out the size and shape of precipitation particles. Very neat enhancement to what we've been able to do with weather radar previously. Now down at the bottom, I said I should just go over and point here. 
you will notice that there's always a gotcha. With this way that dual polarization was first developed, you need a fast switch to go from the horizontal to the vertical pulses. And that fast switch is expensive, and for a big network, expensive switches that go out and have to be replaced add to the cost. Also, by doing it with both horizontal and vertical pulses, it adds to the acquisition time. And all of us like uh, cheap and fast. That solution I just showed you, which, which is the traditional solution, is expensive and slow. So for the WSR88D dual pole upgrade, trying a, a different idea. That different idea is simultaneous transmission of both the horizontal and vertical signals. So we send both in the same pulse and receive it. And it's also called uh, kind of slant 45. So you're sending some vertical component and some horizontal component. So your pulse is actually a canted pulse. You can think of it that way that you're sending it out. And that's good. That means that we can go as fast as we're going now, and we don't need that fast switch. But there's still a gotcha. The problem with this solution is we have to split the power because we're transmitting both vertical and horizontal. So we have a 3 dB sensitivity loss, half the power sensitivity loss. Now, I want to be clear. Sometimes people get confused between a, a power loss and a sensitivity loss. This is a sensitivity loss. It's is not 3 dBZ. The reflectivity, the power returns, all get calibrated. Before dual polarization, 50 dBZ. After dual polarization, 50 dBZ, they're the same. There's no loss. This loss comes in down at the floor, the weakest returns. If previously, the weakest returns you could see in a clear air mode were minus 15 dBZ, now it's going to be approximately minus 12 dBZ. So it's a sensitivity loss, and what you're losing are the weak returns. Now those weak returns are important. We want to see boundaries. We profile the winds from, the from these weak returns. A lot of them are non-precipitation, and so it's, it's uh, not something that we like, and we're working on improving it, but there's still a lot of good clear air signal with, with a loss of only 3 dB. So, you're going to get lots of neat new things to look at. There are three new, new variables. They're like moments that we, that we talked about for the first Doppler implementation. There's differential reflectivity, or ZDR, correlation coefficient. Classically, we call that Rho-HV, but AWIPS, and a lot of this present presentation mentions what they're doing with this in AWIPS for the Weather Service. Correlation coefficient they have is CC. And then the third variable is specific differential phase, or KDP. Then there are three new algorithms. There's a melting layer algorithm, hydrometeor classification algorithm, and a QPE, quantitative precipitation estimation algorithm. And then you get nine new precipitation estimation products. So there's a lot of neat stuff. What I'm going to do is kind of go over that, show a few applications. Then we're going to have the break. Then Paul is going to come up, and he's going to sh share with you a workshop, recent cases, uh, information, I think, from multiple sites around the country where you can see some of these things in action, and along with him, kind of guess at, at what some of the answers are. <laughs> Sometimes it's still a guess. All right, let's first look at ZDR. <coughs> ZDR is simply the ratio of the horizontal to vertical reflectivity, and it's 10 log to the base 10, a dB measurement. Uh, you can see the units, the values. And of course, the way it works is if you have precipitation particles out there that are round, let's for the moment just say those are small raindrops, which are round then the horizontal and the vertical reflectivities are about the same because of the dimensions. Since we're looking at a log quantity, the log of one is zero. So if you have small precipitation particles, round ones, 
you're going to get a ZDR of about zero. Now, if you've got big fat raindrops, they have a very large horizontal dimension, then the horizontal component is going to be a lot larger than the vertical component, and ZDR is going to be significantly above zero. And incidentally, all the things that I'm going to tell you about, except for one little segment coming up, are all appropriate for 10 centimeter radars. When you go to other wavelengths, things change, and I'll briefly speak about them. Then, the other way it works, is if you have something like an ice crystal with a vertical orientation, then the horizontal reflectivity is less than the vertical reflectivity, and DBZ is negative. Uh, I'm sorry, ZDR is negative, not DBZ. ZDR is negative. ZH is less than ZB. So, we can tell a lot about precipitation particles from ZDR. Uh, if it's a low value, it's small, those small raindrops I mentioned, but it also could be hail. If hail is round, it's going to have a low ZDR. Now, sometimes we think of hailstones as having, you know, odd shapes, and they're not all round, but they do tumble. Even the ones with the odd shapes tumble, and so effectively you get uh, the, the radar thinks they're, the particles, uh, hail particles are more round, even if they're not. I'm going to show these for each of the, the variables. Along the top is the range of values. This is in dB. And these are the different type of particles that a radar might see. Some precipitation, some non-precipitation. And then this is the range of values that you might see. Now, the good news is that we see a lot of good stuff. The bad news is we can get a lot of the same values for all kinds of different things. So ZDR by itself usually is not the complete answer. We're going to have to look at something else besides. I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. <coughs> this is a reflectivity image. A lot of these are off of AWIPS because some of this stuff comes from training for weather service forecasters. And we're highlighting three areas. So these are our AWIPS, National Weather Service color mixes, not quite the ones that I use all the time. But here's high reflectivity area. Here's an adjacent somewhat high reflectivity area, but not as high as this one. And then here's an area here, elliptical-shaped region that's low reflectivity, perhaps not precipitation. So here's the ZDRs, where we had that really high reflectivity we have really low ZDR. Putting those two things together, I'm going to guess that there's hail there. Probably a lot of big hail right there. Right over in that next area, if you remember, it was a moderately high reflectivity, but it has a really high ZDR value. So I'm going to guess a lot of big drops. It was probably grapple, and it's melted, and it makes those big, fat raindrops on your windshield. Down here, in the clear air, the ZDR is all over the place because the biological targets are all kinds of different things. Little bitty insects that have low ZDRs, um, big birds and moths that have high ZDRs, plus it's a weak return and it's noisy. We don't talk about it, but at very weak signals, just about every one of our values is biased. Okay, second product. I didn't say it, but I think it's been implied before. If you have any questions, please stop me, or I will ramble on. <laughs> um, the second product is the correlation coefficient. It's a rather tr traditional formula for calculating. I'm not going to say anything about it, uh, other than I'm going to give some, some explanation of um, generally what it means. First thing is if we have non-precipitation, we have uh, the returns that are non-precipitation have a lot of variability in them. And they're going to give us low correlation coefficients. So one thing with dual pole, I mean right off the bat, a, a low-hanging fruit is we can separate precipitation from non-precipitation. 
Don't have to look at multi multiple outputs. Just look at that correlation coefficient. If it's really low, that is very unlikely that it's precipitation. And so we're using that in data quality, and you'll see that more and more. Now, if you have a uniform distribution of precipitation, could be all snow, could be all rain, but if it's uniformly distributed, there's not different types. If, if it's high correlation between the, the different estimates, then we get a really high correlation coefficient. I mean, we're talking real high, greater than 0.97. For some of our work where we're trying to do things like figuring out calibration and verification, we only use values that are 0.99. So we, if, if it's nice, gentle, steady, light rain, there's very high correlation coefficients. Then the third case, the case where we got mixed kinds of precipitation. You're in the melting layer, there's someplace else hail is falling with rain, some other, some other thing is happening. Uh, you will, if you have these mixed kinds of precipitation, then you're going to get this intermediate correlation coefficient. For the precip side, it's not as high as the uniform one, but it's still higher than the non-precipitation. <coughs> so here's an ex whoops, I'm going to jump the example, but not quite. So here's the way correlation coefficient looks for this same distribution of values along the top, kind of, of scatter across the uh, left edge, and all of the precipitation stuff is gathered up here. Relatively high correlation coefficient. The non-precip, except for the melting layer, are down here. So this is our data quality precipitation versus non-precipitation indicator. Sure. I don't know why this says. Paul, why does it say RF there? Uh, in, the, uh, in the middle cut, they still. Uh, oh, well, yeah, okay. It, it's for their cups. See, this is the color mix that's being used. And so they're just reserving that color, but it doesn't have anything to do with the correlation coefficient. They, they've just taken the, the AWIPS color mix and put it up there and put some values on okay. it. We, we still have range folding. Right, right. E even. Yeah, it's, it's just one of the colors. It, okay. It's part of the color mix, so they show it, but it doesn't have anything to do with the correlation coefficient. Good question. He gets a point. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's it used for? Again, the non-weather target's really good for telling, uh, determining that. Melting layer, it's, it's a really, for, for an operator at least, it's a no-brainer typically for the melting layer. And then if we're looking at, at giant hail or tornado debris, it's maybe our most important input. But I'm going to comment on those things a little later. But here's the melting layer example. I mean, it's the easiest way to think a correlation coefficient. This is this area of mixed precipitation. Some melted, some unmelted, and it really stands out. And if you're at some intermediate elevation angle, this one's 2.4 degrees, uh, you can see it very clearly. So in here, where we have these very high correlation coefficients, way up there, that's all rain. Okay. Now, th at this time when these examples were taken, the ground clutter cancellation wasn't working. So this is all impacted by, by ground clutter. That's fixed now, but I'm just too lazy to get a new image. But all of this high, cor high correlation coefficient is rain. Melting layer, then everything up here with, with high values is all snow. So it's pretty clear cut where the demarcations are. I mentioned the biases. Correlation coefficient is very susceptible to bias for weak signal. So you're going to see these things out here at the edge. Operators can easily learn to not look at those, but we're still teaching the computer to not pay attention to that. Yeah. Nobody would put that on the air because that would imply to the viewer that there's this area of frozen precipitation. They're not um, making the correlation that you're looking at height over distance, and so it's what what is is going to be displayed 
on the air for for viewers to look at i'm not completely sure not much of that has occurred yet so you folks may have some good ideas and you can tell me i haven't seen a lot of it on the air uh, some of the algorithm output may be a little bit easier to explain and to use but we still have some of the same problems that the radar beam doesn't bend like the earth curves and and down where people live we may not be able to sense what's going on down there so that isn't that is uh, as always an issue when you have precip aloft that's not falling at the ground you got the same issue okay we have managed to get to the third product and that's specific differential phase but we need to back up the real parameter the real thing here is the differential phase shift we've got a phase for the horizontal pulses we've got a phase for the vertical pulses it's a calibration issue too but that'll come up later but this is our differential phase shift that's the important quantity national weather service in their in their wisdom has decided they wanted to just cut to the chase and go specifically to to specific differential phase. I'll tell you why, but this is also an important parameter to look at, and I would advise people to look at it too, even though it's not an output for the weather service. So it's going to be specific differential phase, not differential phase. We look at definition. It has units. It's units of degrees per kilometer. How much phase shift per kilometer? Now, you may ask, why do we have differential phase shift? Why does that occur? Well, let's think about our signal. Remember, this signal we're sending out, this slanted star, canted 45, it's got the vertical and the horizontal component, that same pulse that we're sending out, and it's going to encounter some precipitation. As that pulse propagates through the precipitation, of course, we get returned back, but the propagation speed starts to differ going through the medium and it differs because the horizontal signal sees a lot of these oblate spheroid raindrops and it gets impeded slightly the vertical signal doesn't suffer from that as much and so it gets ahead that's what creates the phase shift so when you get to the end the back side of the precip you've got a phase shift between the horizontal and the vertical. Now, uh, for, for things like calibration, knowing the total phase shift is a good thing, but again, why the Weather Service picked specific differential phase is they don't want to know the total measurement as the radar beam goes out 250 kilometers. What's really most important is to know Where's that limited area where all that phase shift occurred? Because that's going to turn out to be the important thing we're looking for because that means that there's a lot of liquid water, a lot of rain that impeded that horizontal signal and created that phase shift. So we're looking for, th for the gradient, the derivative of the total, and that's how we get specific <coughs> differential phase. Saying the same thing here, uh, we start out with a phase it's actually not zero, it's above zero. And then we go through, here's where all the phase shift is. You out here, there's anything else we want to know about this part. Now, KDP is a very useful parameter. It's immune to, to partial beam blockage. Uh, some of our other signals, as you know, reflectivity in particular, we have a lot of problems with, with partial beam blockage. KDP is immune to that. I have a great example, which I don't have time to show you from a Vortex 2 data case where we went out chasing storms in the hills and trees of eastern Oklahoma on a tornado day, May 10th, 2010. Greg Forbes will remember. And our reflectivity data through up through about four elevation angles isn't worth a flip because of all that stupid beam blockage. But we've got KDP data, and we can see the distribution of what's going on and how the storm's evolving through looking at the KDP data. So it's neat stuff. It's also immune uh, to this partial beam blockage, uh, this attenuation issue I already mentioned. It's immune to calibration problems that we're suffering with in, in lots of areas. <coughs> and it's 
somewhat immune to the presence of hail, wet hail. Of course, it's going to have some rain, but in general, it's only responding to the rain. Okay, so here's what it looks like. And the values typical at, at S-band go from, when we get significant rain, from 1 up to 3 or 4. If you get way up here, way high, that's rare. So if you get a KDP or 2 or 3, that's, that's uh, really raining. If KDP gets to 4, you might ne need to build a boat. And that's much different than these other precipitation particles. So this is your rain indicator. If you want to know where the heavy rain is, here's another case where you can just look at one output. For the non-precip -pre scatters and returns, it feels very noisy. We do a bunch of averaging. Since this is a gradient, a derivative, it's very noisy all the time. So we have to do averaging, but we can't even fix these with averaging. So, so there is no display in the clear air for KDP because, again, we're after the rain. I think that says the same thing. When I steal these, sometimes I forget they come in parts. Okay, so here's our example again, or, or a similar example. Here's some l areas of high reflectivity and, and pick some, some different ones. Um, there's also some reflectivity down here, but it's not highlighted. And then over here is all of this lighter return, a lot of it probably non precip. So we can look at KDP. First thing is there's no KDP down here. That's all clear air stuff. Here is some precip. Here is some bigger KDPs. This is where the heavy rain is. This is moderate values. If you remember, these were high reflectivities. So it's probably got a lot of hail in it. But the, but the amount of rain, the amount of liquid water is not as high. Now there's some high uh, reflectivity right over here. And notice that we have some blanks in the field. Again, this is a derivative, a gradient. It can suffer from those kinds of issues. If the field is too unstable, even after smoothing, we don't display the result. So there will be a, a few times when you go to see the value you want in a particular place and don't see it. Also, another thing catches my eye, just looking at this, here's another high rain area out here. Just jumps out at you. Okay, we've got three algorithms. We've got melting layer, hydrometeor classification, and of course they have acronyms, and quantitative precipitation estimation. They're all in big print. But don't, don't you just love the asterisk and the small print that goes along? In this case, it is. These algorithms in the WSR88D are all run in the RPG which is at the sites, not, not at the RDA, not, at, not where the, where the uh, transmitter and receiver are. And the level two data that all of us use gets scooped off at the RDA. So if you get level two data, you'll get the information from the dual pole moments, they've been calculated, but you won't get the algorithm outputs. When I spoke last year, I said there's a lot of questions about private sector television and using dual pole because you're not initially going to get the algorithm outputs unless the vendor you're with codes these up and makes them available to you. Now, you can get archive level three, if you want some outputs, there are some of the outputs, outputs, particularly the QPE, the precip, but as you know, they're delayed, they say one to three minutes. Uh, my, my informal sample is usually three minutes or more, so sometimes they're maybe not quite as timely as you want to have them, so I don't give recommendations, but if I was to give recommendations, I would say work with a vendor, work with a good vendor, and have them implement these things. Also, I'm going to spend a lot of the rest of this talk telling you these things aren't very good, and we're going to have to improve them. So as we improve them, then those vendors are going to have to follow along, improve them, and go through this process to get the good stuff and get all the output. <coughs> That's not a great rate way to run a railroad, 
but that's the way that it's being done. Okay, I'm going to kind of start from the top down because one algorithm leads to a second and uses that information into the third, uses the first two and so forth. So the first one is the melting layer algorithm. Now I told you and I showed you a picture that that's an easy thing to see. You look at a, a correlation coefficient and it just jumps out at you where, where the melting level is. So it's easy for the human computer in our head to see it but we're still working to completely teach the digital computer to see it. Because we have some, some issues that, that occur in real life. You might have multiple zero degree levels. Uh, you might have a very broad uh, uh, isothermal layer and, and things that start to and confuse the computer. So for the weather service, and I hope the vendors who code these things up do the same, it needs to be selectable what you're going to use for that melting level value because if you pick the wrong value then the two algorithms underneath garbage in garbage out so the operator can select for the weather service at the rpg whether to use the melting layer algorithm if they're looking pretty easy to see if it's if it's a simple case and it's working right or it's a more complicated case and it's not working so well then you can go with a ruck sounding, right now for the weather service it's just ruck, but there's other, other good mesoscale models and, and uh, folks can get their hands on those, or you can use a balloon sounding. But whatever, you need to pick the one that's best because if the melting layer isn't right, then it affects other things. And I'm gonna show you what melting layer output looks like. This is a case of a nice, pretty simple uh, melting layer and the melting layer detection algorithm does a good job. And it has displays for the center where the edge is first encountering, or where the beam is first encountering and the beam is last encountering the melting level based on calculation of the volume. And, and as, as a human computer, you can see these mixed phase regions both here and here kind of along this band of precip with higher correlation co coefficients in, in here it's somewhat higher out here, and, and, and it, but it, there isn't a whole lot of data uh, above the freezing level. Well, southwest and northeast or something. So this is what it looks like. Weather service people will be looking at these. You all will be looking at whatever your vendor provides. All right, next algorithm. Next algorithm is hydrometeor classification. And None of these algorithms are mature, but the HCA is the most immature. It's got a tough job to do. It's trying to decide what is the dominant scatterer in each, each of the gates, each of the volumes where we make an estimate. And it uses fuzzy logic because there are overlaps. It's using all of the variables, all of the information, and it's putting it together and making best guesses. Now. One thing that's good about it is that there is an estimate for each gate at each elevation angle. So if you're really a sophisticated user, like a numerical modeler, and you want to verify your numerical model, I mean our output's good, you can, you can do that everywhere in the atmosphere, or everywhere with, within the, the volume collection pattern. So here are the current classification outputs. Now, the more are possible. Uh, in Europe, they're, they're more advanced in this dual pole business than we are in the US. I attended a, a European radar conference a year ago, and the, I forget who it was, maybe the Swiss had 44 categories in their hyd hydrometer classification algorithm. Now, about 20 of those were birds and insects. There's only so many ways you can cut up the precip, but you can cut up the non precip stuff into a, into a lot of things if, if you want and you're smart enough to do that. We're not doing that yet, as you can see, we're lumping it together. But in the future, for ornith ornithologists and others who want to make studies, there's a lot more stuff that we can do with this dual pole to help them. So what we're outputting now, and these are the colors that are in the weather service color mix, don't know about anybody else, 
There's light to moderate rain, heavy rain, hail, big drops, those big fat hamburger shaped drops, the melting grapple. You want to know about those because they get really high reflectivity, but they don't produce a lot of rain. So it's good for the operator to know about them, and it's really good for precipitation estimation not being able to know about them. Gropple, ice crystals, dry snow, wet snow, can't make a decision. That does happen. AP or ground clutter, we have clutter residue, and then we have clutter filters, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and of course we all know we get AP under proper atmospheric conditions, and then all this stuff gets lumped under biologicals, which can be broken in, into smaller segments, but it is not now. We can't get these, these first few right, so probably no reason to go to the others. Now we are going to add one, of course, adding and quickly don't necessarily go together with the government. But not Bill 13, which is the first dual poll bill, but Bill 14, which is a year and a half away, hopefully, uh, will probably have a tornado debris category added because it's something we can see pretty easily. And it's sexy. Everybody likes that, and so we're going to add that. We had a big tornado year, so government wants to show they're doing better. One thing we can do is show a tornado debris category. Craig mentioned we, we've got these challenges with, with showing dual pole output to the public about what's going on. And this is an example of part of that challenge. Our radar beam doesn't bend at the same rate the Earth curves, so if you get very far away from the radar, you're looking up higher. And you may show something that's not occurring at the ground. You may be in a melting layer, whereas below there's a shallow layer of cold air and you've got freezing rain, but you don't know, you might have warm rain, who knows. So that's definitely a challenge. We have a big challenge in verification. Again, we need to know the answers up here to see how well we're doing. <coughs> we get these answers down here that have the limitations. So what we need to do is to fly an airplane up there. Problem is we haven't had an airplane to fly. We had a research aircraft. T-28, some of you old-timers may remember, it got old and isn't used, hadn't been used for some time now, but we're right on the verge of getting a new aircraft. NCAR, South Dakota School of Mines, have an A, oh, and the military, Air Force, are going to have an A-10 Warthog aircraft, which is a perfect aircraft for this kind of work. It's got a lot of armor plating, it can go slow, uh, do all the neat things we'd like to have done, so starting as early as next year, there is a checkout for that, for that plane, and hopefully we'll start seeing more and more data where they fly through precipitation at altitude, and, and with the sensors on board the craft, they can tell us what kind of precipitation particles, and with that verification, certainly be a component in our doing better. Put that into our fuzzy logic. Okay, here is... Uh, Precipitation, again, these, these are kind of old, outdated. I'm still using them. This is reflectivity. Uh, these are supercell-like storms. Here is the <coughs> output from HCA for the classifications. You can see the different categories. The hail stands out. You can see the heavy rain, light rain. You get above the freezing level as you get out there, but you get all kinds of answers. I, I, I've kept this one, even though things have gone beyond this. I've kept it because it's a good example of how tough this is and how often we still make mistakes at this HCA business. You can look at a higher elevation angle. This one's up. Three, this is now three degrees, so we're mostly above freezing. You see a lot of dry snow now, but you still see some, some grapple hail categories as you should, these are probably better answers. A little easier up high to get the categories right, but there's occasional miss even there. Now for certain uses like uh, precipitation estimation, QPA, we do averaging. So if, there, if the number of misclassifications is a reasonably small number, we can average through it. Not always. Okay, third is the QPE algorithm. And this is the one that, that maybe has the most attention. 
sold to a poll on the fact that we could estimate precipitation better, so by golly, we ought to be able to do that. This is a rule-based algorithm. The rules have changed. They're going to continue to change for a while because as I'm going to show you, we still don't have it quite right. It uses reflectivity, differential reflectivity, and specific differential phase. All three in different categories, different times, different ways. And there, there's nine new products that are coming. Uh, uh, for the new products, uh, generally they match the legacy products. So you we didn't want to create things that work different, look different. Uh, they're instantaneous rate. There's user selectable duration products, things you're familiar with. There's different products, which are really neat, interesting to look at. Again, for weather service users, they're going to have these and we'll be looking at them. Important point, of course, it's for the weather service, but for anybody who uses this, I wouldn't throw away the legacy products just yet. I'm going to show you some times where legacy is better <laughs> than dual pole. I know that's heresy, but that's the truth. And so I, w I would continue to look at these some as well and compare. Now, this is work that was done to set this up. All very good research work done <coughs> in, in Oklahoma. It's the only place we had a dual pole radar, at least in the 48 states, that, that was available for this kind of thing. And we developed some nice results. Uh, there's several different curves along here. The two to pay attention to are the blue and the red. Uh, the, the blue is, is reflectivity with a PPS, the, the traditional reflectivity only. The red one is the uh, QP algorithm using KDP, Z, and ZDR, and, and using it in various ways. And if you look at the root mean square error, that error is lower till you get out to a pretty far range away from the radar for, for the QPE. <coughs> Good. And if you look at the bias, it's generally unbiased till you get out here a ways. And then it goes to an underestimate, as does PPS, because as you go above the freezing level, you're not going to correlate very well anymore with the stuff below the freezing level. That looks good, and that led to first first uh, algorithm deployment. But if I don't put you to sleep, I'm going to show you some more details of how we're, we're still need to work on it. Now, here's an example. I always like to show something positive. This is from Moorhead City. This is Hurricane Irene making landfall. Uh, these are the rain gauges, the HADS rain gauges, <laughs> that, that were collected by... Uh, the weather service, the system, and so you can overlay the storm total precip on the gauge rainfall totals. Now, I haven't set it up to now, but I'll talk some more about there's rain gauges and then there's rain gauges. V I told you verification was tough because we didn't have good data above the ground. I really implied that our data at the surface were good. Some of our, some of our rain gauge data is not, it's not so good. I, I get to live in Oklahoma. Kristen's not here, but she and I would tell you we're among the privileged few. We get to live in Oklahoma where they have a really good rain gauge network. We have a meso network that's a gold standard for rain gauges. Dynamite stuff. Go anyplace else, of course I'm biased, I don't think it's as good. If your rain, if your rain gauge data isn't very good, then we're going to have a lot of trouble even verifying this stuff. Cases in point. Here are the <laughs> gauges that the Weather Service got. This is the official result for Hurricane Irene. Here's a 13.1 inch amount adjacent to a two-tenths of an inch amount. Doesn't make meteorological sense to me. Uh, here's some other, here's three-tenths. Um, if you pick selectively for these gauges, you might say we have a fairly good correlation. This brightest color here, northeast of Moorhead City, where the hurricane ma made landfall kind of pivoted as it went north, we have values of about 15 inches storm total. And I see a 14.79, a 15.74, 15.66, but just gives you a feeling for how tough this verification is. It's hard to be objective. I can't average those. I just have to pick and choose. Well, you get subjective and it gets, the world gets tougher. So 
if you ever get a chance, vote for Rain Gauge Network. I haven't seen. I haven't seen it either. Gonna I think Mitt Romney is on that. Yeah. We're we're all going to have to work on that. All right. Right quick applications. I'm going to look at some things there. Being a storm freak, I, I just love to see the different storms in Oklahoma. We had a flash flood back in June of 2010. Big heavy rain caused lots of problems. As they always do in metropolitan areas. This is the PPS, uh, the, the, the estimates we've had before, the legacy, so-called legacy estimates, and it's using 300R to the 1.4 relationship. For those of you who know relationships, that's a continental relationship. This was, this was a case where we had lots of moisture, so it was kind of semi-tropical relationship. Uh, in the in the uh, precipitation processing system, you can change those relationships. People don't always change them. And so that's another advantage with dual pole. You don't have to worry about changing relationships anymore once we're into dual pole. But anyhow, you can see the amounts. The maximum amounts there are fours and fives and sixes mostly. But, but if you see here, now these are the micronet gauges. There's a meso network in Oklahoma done by Oklahoma Climate Survey and a micronet. These are in the micronet. And you see values almost 10 inches for the biggest one I see right there. So it was underestimating. PPS was underestimating. Here's dual pole. And uh, there's a bunch of 6, 8, 9, almost 10 inch amounts kind of in the right place. So just a qualitative look. It's doing better. And we lived with these qualitative looks for a while. But we're now doing quantitative looks. That's still coming easiest thing, maybe the most fun thing out of this, and this is something last year when I played the game of find something in the data. For those of you who were here last year, showed you a reflectivity, and I showed you four different cells and, and said, tell me which one of these is the heavy rain producer. Well, it might not just jump out at you. Here's ZDR. might not just jump out at ZDR either. There are some high ZDRs. There's some big drop regions, but there's some areas that are, that are intermediate, quite a few. If you look at correlation coefficient, there's generally high correlation coefficients. It's a rain situation. If you look at KDP, to me, it just jumps out. There's the heavy rain. That's the one. That's the place. If you're going to issue an a urban flash flood statement, if you're going to issue a, a weather advisory, or if it meets criteria, a flash flood warning, there's your info. So we do, we do have a lot of good stuff. I think it's my job to talk about our warts and wrinkles some, but I don't want to ever underplay the fact that we have something really good out there that, that uh, forecasters, meteorologists can use right now. I mean, this is a lot better than we've ever had before, a lot better than looking just at reflectivity and trying to figure out with some relationship where the heavy rain is. Okay, thunderstorm examples. If you look at vertical cross-sections, you have to, of course, create them special, but if you create them, or if you just look at, at uh, uh, intermediate elevation angles that are, that are part of them, you see column features, and those column features are related to updraft. You see differential reflectivity columns, and, and you see specific differential phase columns. So these are our ZDR. Here's our reflectivity. Here's our melting level. You can see it. This, so beyond the melting layer, out where ge things are generally frozen, we see these areas of high ZDR. Why do we see them? Those are the updraft areas. We have super cool liquid un unfrozen raindrops up there or just in the process of freezing, and we get these high ZDR values. So if you look at a vertical cross-section, you have a column. We're cutting through that column. Neat stuff. This is specific differential phase, same thing. KDP, again, is not very sensitive to the mixed phase stuff. You don't see much for the melting layer, but you do see higher liquid water in those updrafts above the freezing line. And, and the height of these and the magnitude of these gives you at least some qualitative information about the strength of those updrafts and how they're changing. So here are the, 
some vertical sections. This is through a supercell storm. And this is range, this is height. So here is a really nice ZDR column. I'm guessing the freezing level is down in here somewhere. And you can see this is well above the freezing level. And you can see extending down to the ground. These are probably big drop regions extending down to the ground. And here's the mature updraft, and this is probably a developing flanking updraft. So here's the ZDR part. Here's the KDP part, higher KDPs here. You can see all that liquid, and you can see where it's falling to the ground. Right down there is your heavy rain. So they're very useful. Uh, you've got to dig a bit to look at it, but if you do, you can monitor updraft strength. The first thing you're going to see when those updrafts are growing, even before you get high reflectivity, you're going to see some ZDR and KDP information and can give you some lead time. If you're really into the minute-by-minute the minute lead time business, there is potential in these kind of outputs. Okay, the tornado debris signature is getting kind of well known. I think a lot of examples were seen this warm season in our big tornado year. It's a fairly uh, easy to depict thing when it's there. Nothing's ever completely easy, but fairly easy. Here's the reflectivity, hook echo. Here is uh, ZDR, very low value of ZDR. Why would it be low? Debris got all these random orientations. There's no set orientation. There, there's no um, place where, where we have hor horizontal uh, polarization much higher than vertical like we do up here. This, this is, this is the so-called ZDR arc of big drops in supercells. Tells you a lot, but I'm not going to go into it. But there's a lot of difference between that or the rain areas and that little donut hole. That little donut hole is debris. Here it is in correlation coefficient, day in and day out, wavelength independent. Correlation coefficient is a little better than ZDR, but, but they're both pretty good. And, and there's where it shows up in correlation coefficient down to very low values. It's not precipitation. Now, I'm going to tell you in a minute that what you need to do is always look at velocity first if you're looking for a reflectivity signature because there's a lot of little things in dual pole data, and if you're just looking at the dual pole outputs only, you could get confused. We're still working through about the signatures, the details of the signature. Might find some new things with Vortex 2 data as we keep analyzing that. We're starting to get a few mature analyses yet. Haven't seen any new stuff jump out, but, but we're wading our way through analyzing those data and we may learn more. So this is an example. This is one from last year when we were playing around. This is May 10th, uh, east of, of uh, Norman. First you go to the velocity signatures. And here's three humdinger velocity signatures. Right here, right here, and right here. You, those are either called humdingers or barn burners, one of the two. <laughs> and you can see where they are in reflectivity. You go over to ZDR, and this is why I tell you don't look at the, Z, don't look at the dual pole variables first. Once I kind of know where to look, yes, all those values are relatively low, but they don't just completely jump out at me like that first example I showed you. Here is correlation coefficients. Maybe a little better because some of these do kind of jump out at me. But it, it's, this is a, an output that's best appreciated when you look at it with the, <coughs> with the multiple outputs and when you start with the velocity first. Now, for some of these classic supercells, like this one, except maybe a little better for some of them, when you have a debris ball that's unfortunately going through a town or a metropolitan area, it becomes very simple again. But if you're trying to see them all, it... I have that recommendation. Okay, a winter storm. I showed this last time. We, ha we haven't had a better winter storm in central Oklahoma, so I keep showing the <laughs> old one. We, we had a really nice, if you're a weather freak, blizzard in central Oklahoma on Christmas Eve 2009. F for, for everybody, this was not a good situation be because it, everybody was traveling. There were fairly good forecasts, but 
they didn't say stay home or you'll lose your life. Maybe they should have because it got life threatening. And unfortunately, there were people who died in this flu. But here here are some data in central Oklahoma. I have some different parameters on here. Wind, temperature. These are on the hour precipitation uh, types at uh, uh, OKC at Will Rogers Airport. Then down at the bottom are snow uh, snowfalls, hourly snowfalls as reported again at the Oklahoma City site, and their accumulated snow. So that for us, this was this was that humdinger of a storm. Uh, we started out above freezing, had light rain in the morning, the, the very classical go to freezing rain, sleet in the mixed phase region. Then about noontime, we went to heavy snow, and I'm talking really heavy snow, and it was occurring while the wind was over 50 knots, over 60 miles per hour. So we, we had snowfall rates as high as 3 inches per hour with those high winds, and you can see the accumulation going up. We had 14-inch accumulation and three, four, five-foot snow drifts. So traffic was completely uh, stopped. And it occurred during the day when people were trying to travel. So let's look at some radar data. This is from KOUN, central Oklahoma, middle of the day. This is reflectivity. Over on the right is correlation coefficient. And, of course, the game is... Where is the, the uh, melting level, the mixed phase stuff, and where does it go to all snow? With reflectivity, you maybe get some ideas, but with correlation coefficients, you get a much better idea that everything over in here has some mixed phase attributes, but right around the radar, over in here, over in there, that's all snow. Now, there is a little zone here that, that shows some some mixed phase. I'm not sure what those are. Those may be really big aggregates because these are very high reflectivities, up to 40 dBZ. Apparently all snow, at least as reported by surface observers. Some of this coming over Will Rogers is what produced the three inches per hour amounts. So its correlation coefficient is very useful, particularly for an operator, to determine precipitation type. Here's another example. I think this is from the same event. Uh, this is slightly earlier, and this, sh this shows the time. He here the, the melting level is much easier to see, but you see that this wedge is knocked out of it. This is where it's below freezing up at, up at the airport, which is right up here. It's already snowing. Where I lived down in here, still got mixed phase stuff. And then southeast of there, I think they had freezing rain still. Okay, I told you I was going to say a little bit about Five centimeter radar and, and three. I play with three centimeter radar uh, on board mobile vehicles on trucks. But some of you, television, I know, have five centimeter radars, and some of you may be looking at dual polarization for five centimeter radar. And I don't want to dissuade you, but I do want to tell you life is a little more complicated at those wavelengths, and it's those darn laws of physics again. They come back and give us trouble. The full radar equation is ugly, and a scattering equation, we don't want to deal with it. We, we want to make the Rayleigh approximation, which we generally can at 10 centimeter wavelength, as long as those particles are less than a, a tenth of the radar wavelength, then, then we can use a much simplified equation. We like to do that, and I'll show you what it means when we, when we don't do that. But at 5 centimeter and 3 centimeter, we have to use the full me scattering formulation. I'll show you what that means. These are effective diameters, backscatter cross-sections. Black is S-band, blue is C-band, red is X-band. This is for uh, dry precipitation particles. These are for wet precipitation particles. And you see that there are some differences. There are also some nulls and all kinds of crazy things in that scattering equation that, that uh, we don't like to deal with, but, but have to be dealt with, particularly at the lower wavelengths. You can see the, the response at S-band, although it's got still some, some things, is, is uh, not near as complicated as the shorter wavelengths. And then, if you go over here, 
and you look at some, some uh, modeling output at equivalent diameter, first for ZDR on this scale, and then down at the bottom, equivalent diameter versus KDP, specific differential phase, and you look again with the same color categories, you'll see that X-band has a nice, somewhat linear response. Even the red X-band is a little better. Some of the things we do with X-band, although we, we have issues, they're not quite as bad as C-band. You'll notice the C-band response has got this giant peak out here at, at these size particles because they're just at the right, si the right size to have what's called resonance scattering, and it produces strange responses. So you can see s get some higher ZDRs. That's not necessarily so bad. But you come down here and look at something like KDP, and you'll see as your diameters get larger, it goes from higher to lower to higher again. So you can't even count on a linear relationship. Now, these things aren't hopeless. They can be overcome. We do corrections at X-band. And again, I'm biased because I'm a part of doing it. But, but I will tell you that I think they're pretty darn good. And we're getting a tremendous amount of information uh, about precipitation uh, microphysics from the X-band radars, and I'm sure we can do it at C-band too. I just don't know how far along in the development everybody is on that. I know where I live, we're not completely through with that development for the C-band stuff yet. Okay, let's look at some of these issues for associated with the upgrade. Okay, we've got 30 minutes left. So y'all either ask a question or I'm going to show you a lot of details. <laughs> uh, thank you, yeah, thank you, <laughs> think hard. Uh, there's a lot of things that, of course, we can't do. Mentioned the laws of physics, those limitations. We can't do perfect rainfall estimation. We can't do exact hail sizes, although we're working on that. This business of getting surface precip type when our radar data is aloft, we've got issues. We don't have a debris signature for every tornado, although at close range to the radar, Paul and I were talking about this morning, even some minor tornadoes now in areas where you've got something to be picked up. Uh, he was telling me of a case of Atlanta for weak tornadoes, and, and down in that area there's trees and stuff, and uh, had dual pole signatures. So, so we're still learning how many do and how many don't, but I'm pretty sure we can't detect every tornado, and of course not predicting tornadoes. But what dual pole has to do, and this is the battle we've been fighting, is it has to be calibrated. This is a big, complicated enhancement. We're putting in new plumbing. We've got two channels for transmit and receive. And everything's got to be balanced, got to be calibrated. We need ZD, ZDR, this is maybe the most important, it's in red, ZDR with an accuracy of one or at most two-tenths dB. If we don't have that, then, then we're going to make too many errors and particularly our algorithm outputs are going to go down the tube. I'll show you. The other thing that's important as far as calibration is differential phase. We have to have an initial differential phase in both channels, and those have to be balanced because we're assuming we're starting with the same phase. If we don't start with the same phase, if they're already imbalanced, then we're going to get an improper differential phase. We're doing better with this one. We had some problems with it for a while, but... It's in the white. This one's still in the red. Now, all this comes down then to both the, the kind of hardware we put in and maintaining that hardware. We, we have to go mostly with automated calibration routines. We can't calibrate li like we'd really like to. And the tech manuals are still being worked on. All of those LTACs at all of those radar sites have got to be able to maintain this sucker and fix it. And most important, They've got to figure out, or got to figure out with help of the meteorologist, when it's starting to go in, into Never Never Land. Now, there's a sensitivity loss. Uh, at first, the contractor had a huge sensitivity loss that slowed the program down. We've got that down now where it needs to be, and, and we're working on methods to, to even get maybe another dB or two back. Okay, so you know we blew the first schedule. I told you that last year. We blew it by a couple of years. So what have we been doing? Well, we've been working on 
the ZDR calibration, differential phase calibration, something else I haven't mentioned up to, up to now, even though we try to put these in, in, uh, in areas where we can control temperature, that doesn't always occur. So the components and the outputs are temperature sensitive, and as temperature changes, then, then that changes the calibration things, sometimes in ways that we have trouble handling. Uh, we, we'd like to do the full system calibration that some other kind of radars do. When we take our little X-band radar out and we want to calibrate it, we just point it vertically in light rain. Since we know those characteristics of light rain, it tells us whether we're good or bad and how far off we are. Unfortunately, the WSR-88D was not built to point vertically, so we can't use That's called the bird bath technique because the antenna looks like a bird bath at that point. So if somebody ever talks about that, we can't do the bird bath technique. Now, there is a cross-polarization technique that NCAR uses. It's much easier when you have the switching than, than when you send the canted signals, but it's being worked on. But I've said for a year we're going to get something soon. We still don't have anything from that yet, so I don't know how long. Uh, we beat on the KRUN radar for years, and I think we've got it to where it now may be a tenth of a dB, dB calibration that we want. But I would bet many that there's probably no other radar in the fleet that's that quite that good yet. Um, when we think about ZDR and think about this calibration business, we have to work with the calibration system that's in the radar. So the true ZDR is what we measure plus or minus, whatever, the calibration value, the change that comes from calibration. And that, that change comes from an offline calibration that's done, not, not as often as I would like, but then there's real issues for that. Th those those LTECs have to maintain lots of equipment. They can't just sit there and, and baby that radar as I would like them to do. But they make an offline, full calibration as best they can, in injecting signals, and then we do have uh, a, a short retrace check, and then we have a more full eight-hour check. Now, we've always had eight-hour checks. Some of you may <coughs> or may not have known that occasionally your data would look a little delayed, maybe by up to a minute. That was that eight-hour calibration recheck going on. With dual pole, it's more significant, and it's no longer gonna, every eight hours that you're not going to lose a minute. You're going to lose maybe three or four minutes while they go through that process. But bear with it, it really needs to do that to see when the calibration is changing so we can compensate for that. So that's how we get the, RD, the ZDR system that we subtract. So in a perfect world with perfect calibration, we, we make a measurement, we apply the, the ZDR system, the calibration number, and we come up with a perfect ZDR output. How do we check that? I told you about our limitations. Well, there's one thing that you can do is you can look at light rain. Again, light rain with these small raindrops should have a, a fairly predictable ZDR value. We expect a value of 0.23 at 20 dBZ. Now, remember reflectivity is proportional to the number times the diameter to the sixth power. So you can get 20 dBZ with a few large particles, which messes up the relationship. But if you average enough, and if you try to make sure you're looking at a light rain case, which we do, this is how we're doing some of our verification work, we should expect our ZDR to be about there. Here's a case from Vance Air Force Base, one of the first beta sites, and its 20 dBZ value was up here, 0.65. Should have been 0.23. It says after all the calibration number, everything's been done, our estimate of ZDR error, 0.42. And again, we want 0 0.1, 0 0.2 at the max. So not very good for that radar at that time. That's why there's been a lot of work doing a lot of things to try to improve these. Here's another radar. This is in August. This is Moorhead City. And we get about 0.45, where we should get... 0.23, so we're down now to about 0.22, it's getting better. Some, uh, some other radars and the trend in the radars, a lot of things have been done, a lot of people have worked hard, 
good things have happened. Now, I've just shown you something really interesting. I showed you Vance Air Force Base in the center of the country, and I showed you Moorhead City on the coast. And I've got these plots. These are ZDR values versus reflectivity, and we don't just look at 20. We plot out a whole bunch of them. And by the way, these are correlation coefficients have to be as high as 0.99. Make sure we're looking at just rain. And we're looking at a range where we can make good measurements. We're looking at 2.4 degrees elevation. We're out of any residual ground clutter. And we're looking at heights below 2.5 kilometers because we don't want to get close to the melting level. So it should be our best data. And I show you this distribution. Then I just showed you that distribution. And they look a lot different. Why? Why would they look different, and what is that trying to tell us, besides just the 20 dBc? Something we can really, really use. This is a continental system, precipitation system, and the drop size distribution is much different than the one at Moorhead City. Remember that reflectivity factor is the number of particles and the diameter to the sixth factor. If we have lots of big particles, we're going to get high reflectivities. If we have a lot of small raindrops with low ZDRs, we're not going to get as high reflectivities. We have drop size distribution information. Working with modelers now, or everybody's working with modelers now, where I live, and they can start using that information in the models. So there's another thing still in research, but we're going we're to make some hay with that over time. Okay, here is at that Vance Air Force Base, the first site we went to after KOUN, and after some hard hardware upgrades that were made to try to fix some of our calibration issues, this is how our ZDR error has gone, a function of time for rain events with all those caveats like I told you, lots of volume scans in each event, goes from August through October, you can see that our error went from about 0.4, it's kind of come down gradually to where we're getting some good estimates. And those are the kind of trends we like to see. Of course, we worked on this radar quite a bit. All right, let's look at some rain gauges. Uh, I maybe have too much, so I'm going to skip through this, but I need to tell you that for, for trying to do verification of the QPE algorithms, we've concentrated on three sites. Care you in because we've had it for a long time and we've made it better. Vance Air Force Base because we've also had it for a fairly long time. And then Wichita because uh, we've had it for quite a while. So we've looked at those three. They're all continental. Haven't gotten into the tropical biz yet except for that kind of output I showed you. Here are the kinds of statistical techniques that we're using. We're also doing some resampling things to make sure that, that our cases are good. But look at these large number of radar gauge pairs. Another thing that can get you a small sample size. We've got a lot of gauge pairs here. So here are results for KOUN. These are dual pole, and then these are the, the PPS processing system. When you collect level one and, and then process the data forward, if, as we've done, you can process both systems, po both kinds of things completely. And the legacy system has more scatter. You can see that the points are, are distributed. Uh, this is the radar estimates, and these are the gauge estimates. And if we were perfect, they'd all lay along the same line. So if you look at the root mean sque square error, the RMSE, and we look at the PPS, and we look at the dual pole, and we look at the first the whole set of data, and then we look at, at various parts of the data, higher and higher rainfall amounts, then we can look and See if their differences, are they significant? With KRUN, our best radar, looks like we're doing a better job. You can see for, for all of the rain categories, as you divide it up, we're doing better. Good stuff. We can also look at the bias. That's KRUN, that's PPS. KRUN stays a little higher as we get out to, to longer ranges. PPS doesn't. Again, looking at the statistics on bias, shows that KOUN is doing better. All good news. We like KOUN. 
another interesting thing to do is take a particular gauge and look at it volume scan by volume scan, so instantaneous rates. This was a, a big supercell, or actually a train of supercells along a stationary front that occurred in Oklahoma in the spring, and there was a high rainfall amount, nearly six inches. This is the rate and the final accumulation for legacy and then for dual pole. Now, we're not perfect. As we get high reflectivities in here in hail, we're not accumulating much rain. PPS is really accumulating a lot, but even dual pole is accumulating too much. We're not accounting, accounting enough for the hail that was there. And you see then those things continue on. You can't ever recover, even though our trends are pretty good. We get right at the end, we're also overestimating for some reason. I'm not quite sure what the deal is. We need an airplane to fly through that. So we overestimated the big rain with dual pole, but not nearly as much as PPS. This is the hail bias of the PPS system, well known. Anybody who looks at hail storms knows that if we have hail, our rainfall estimates are way too high. We're getting better, but we're not, we're not there yet. But this is just one, one of those gauges. I told you we had 800 pairs for KUN. That's one of them, one of those 800. Now here's Wichita. This is a radar that went in as a, a beta site, got the two-week installation. That's it. Go forth and do good, guys. And here, not much difference in the distribution. Also, you look at this, the statistics and not much significant difference. We're not really much better. And sometimes the, the errors are, are higher with do a poll. If you look at per the whole data set, now it's not statistically si significant, but showing slightly, slightly higher error than the legacy. So this is why I'm telling you that, that it's not always perfect. We've got some issues. There's some NWS sites out there getting the radar, looking at some of their estimates. Cleveland's one of those places. And they're saying, my gosh, it's not any better. What's going on with this sucker? We're still working with an immature algorithm. And if we have light rain, particularly we have a lot of things in, in the mixing level, uh, in the wintertime when you have rain, a lot of stuff in, in, in that mixing level, we can make some errors with dual pole. Here's what happens. I told you it was our QPE was rule based. If we determine from the mixing level, al mixing layer algorithm, that, that we have dry snow, then we're going to make our rainfall rate just the reflectivity, the same as PPS is doing. But if we get above the melting level, again, dry snow or ice crystals, then we take and multiply the reflectivity rate by 2.8. Well, if we make a mistake and get the wrong kind of particle, we're making much heavier rain than might exist by multiplying by 2.8. It's not good. So we're going to have to work on that. It's not finished. Don, is there any indication um, to, the, to the operator when it's not working and when it is working? When it's no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. If, if you're, if you're uh, astute, you might note that some of the dual pole variables don't look right. Uh, that calibration number that comes out every volume scan, it, it maybe it doesn't look right. Uh, you might have some real-time gauge information that's coming in, and it doesn't look right. So, I mean, you can work to get some indicators, but there isn't, there isn't any place on the display that's going to come up and say, sorry, guys, this is a bad estimate. <laughs> We're not good at that. Okay, now to this deployment. Of course, we, we weren't on time. Uh, we've got, we went through all the machinations. We went to this beta test. We saw some of these bugs in the beta test, but come down to a decision. Do you accept it with some warts and wrinkles and try to fix them? Or do you say, nope, we're not going to accept this thing. Let's start over. In the current economic climate, it was judged that a start over decision would mean no dual pole for a decade, maybe. So it was chosen to accept with some limitations, and we'll work on them. I've shown you enough data to let you know that we're working on them some. And now we're on a very uh, aggressive deployment schedule. Now, I've got to mention one thing about this deployment. 
told you we, there's a lot of good things we've done to this radar. Super resolution. Another really good thing we've done to the radar you may not know about is clutter, mit clutter mitigation decision making, CMD, done in the RDA, done with level one data, looking at the spectra and, and determining where we need to filter to get rid of ground clutter. Spectral components near zero radial velocity. Here's an example. This is through a clutter map, what we've used before, clutter map, clutter zones, cl uh, filter everything, which knocks down the precip. Here's a bunch of residual ground clutter AP, something that was getting through our map. We run CMD, it's nice as the baby's bottom. Good stuff. <laughs> uh, CMD in the background has made the data much better everywhere, mountain regions, everywhere. One problem. We didn't get CMD going until 2009. For the contract in dual pole, we had to give the contractor their baseline in 2008. So as dual pole goes in, CMD goes away. So initially, the color clutter filtering is not going to be as good. So another thing you're going to notice with the dual pole radar when it comes in is more bad stuff. We're going to put out a build sometime during the warm season of this year, a dual pole build, that will have CMD back in it. And it'll be an improved CMD because it'll use dual pole now. I told you there was all that good stuff about non-precip and knocking it out with dual pole. We can take advantage of that. So we're going to end up with a better CMD. So sites that get installed after July, August, something, they'll get installed with a new build now, and it'll be better. Okay, so here was September, and we just were starting. The first deployments were going on. We'd had the beta sites in, and we were just starting to deploy. First, we were deploying in the northwest. Green is deployment complete. Red is deployment in progress, and you can see where it was on that day. Another interesting thing, look at the really large area for one of the radars. How many of you are tuned in to Langley Hill. New radar, Western Washington. We had a problem. The old radar is on the wrong side of the terrain. We couldn't see to the west. Com complaints, complaints at the, at, the, uh, at the highest of levels, and we get a new radar. Out of parts, we made a new radar, put it in. That Western Washington radar now is providing data that looks out a long ways into the Pacific, relatively long ways, without without blockage and problems to see storms coming. Another interesting thing is why that circle looks so big is there because we had to file a new environmental impact statement, not like the ones we filed way back there where we said we'd never go below a half degree. With this one, we said, yep, we're going to go below half a degree. We're going to go down to two-tenths of a degree. turns out z z uh, you don't get much when you go from two-tenths to zero if you're on the flat ground. So we go down to two tenths. So that's why the area is larger because you get quite a bit more coverage just dropping at three tenths of, of a degree for that low elevation angle. Slightly, slightly not as bad a problem. Now, we're a long ways from doing that everywhere. We still have those 162 environmental impact statements that say we won't do that. And there's never been the corporate will to fight it because there was such a big battle over it to begin with. Some of you who are old may remember Mothers Against Radiating Kids, Mark, and the protests that they did for the radars and sitting on site and having to be arrested so that we could put the bulldozer in to build the site. Joe Friday on Montel Williams and totally being <coughs> attacked by people verbally, almost physically, about how can you do such a terrible thing and putting in a radar that's going to radiate people and hurt them. Of course, it doesn't. It's a pulse system. We only send a little bit of radiation and the, ring and the beam moves. It doesn't stay in the same place. Well below any environmental impact hazard. The problem is it's all out there. All that stuff is out there. And the fight to change the elevation angles is far from over. With new radars, we can do better. With the old radars, I don't know how long. The next fight, if there is a fight, if there's a corporate will for a fight, will be at mountaintop radars because not too many people live around mountaintop radars, and they're the ones who are going to benefit the most because they're up at 10,000 feet looking even higher, and all the people live below that. Close to here is Grand Junction radar, which is a classic example of that. I go fishing in the Gunnison area. What that radar sees doesn't have anything to do with what I see down on the ground. 
Okay. So here is January. Here, here is right now. So we have a kind of a pod in the northwest. We have a pod around the Great Lakes. Uh, we got a bit of a pod going here in, in the central plains. Got some in the southwest. Weather service, the agencies determine the order of these things to take it away from uh, when some of their peak season for weather was. Uh, the agencies have to share, give and take, just like we put in the radars in the first place. So all those things went into this schedule, and, and so it doesn't always look logical. But it's nice when we get pods of multiple radars because then you can do a regional composite of some of these good things. So by June, I think by June we will have, well I can't tell, but at some times we're going to have up to five deployment teams in the field. And deployment's going well. They're beating the two weeks. It's a two-week downtime, and almost every site we're beating that. So deployment's going really well. You'll see then by, by June we'll, we'll have a lot of coverage. Of course, a lot of areas where we don't, but, but coverage is really getting better, and coverage is getting good along the East Coast. If we have tropical systems, we're going to get some hopefully neat stuff on precipitation estimation. Then by uh, next winter, 2012, it's really starting to get filled in. Uh, the Gulf Coast still needs some help. Some of the central plains, but other than that, we're doing pretty good. And of course, these coverage maps show you all those areas where we don't have good coverage. Hey That's Aaron, another story. Yeah. I noticed a lot of those uh, June um, deployments were in tornado areas, and you're talking about a maybe a 10-day to 14-day window. Mm -hmm. Once the commitment is made for deployment, can can they pull the plug and plug the radar back in for an, a significant event, or are we no? No, it, it's down. I mean, I, I mean, you you unplumb this sucker. It's <laughs> you can't flip a switch and make it work till you finish. Once they take it all apart. The dog. There is a one one to two day window where you know, say say a massive outbreak forecast right right before we're going to take the radar. Down. Yeah. They can delay the. They, they can delay the start. Yeah. The now start I think I th I think they've agreed to not ever you know com completely right. say we're not going to do that in this window, but they could delay a, a day or two. Also. There is a discussion ab about the possibility of taking a portable radar, one of the Oklahoma radars or one from somebody else, and putting it out of sight if a really bad situation started to come up during the downtime. But I don't think that's been finalized yet, just discussed. When the blizzards in the south are getting really bad, they have no day of field activity, so you have to go out and do what? Right. I would think that would be a huge liability. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't want to tell you that areas of low po population density don't get the same attention as areas of higher population intensity, <laughs> but somebody who was logical might make that assumption. Okay, that's next winter. So by April of 2013, we will have them all in. And the last radar to be installed is poor old Midland, Texas. Talk, talk about a poor lobby. They've got the worst, I guess, <laughs> and so they get go in the last. Okay. Summary, I do need to quit, is that deployment's underway after all these problems. During 2012, we're going to start producing lots of data. Not at Goodland during the blizzard, but lots of data in lots of different places. If it does snow this winter, we hope to get a bunch of that and see how that goes and Severe storms, hurricanes, tropical systems, whatever, we, the, the amount of data should grow exponential, exponentially. And these problems that we're having, calibration, algorithm, precipitation estimation, we are working on it. I know that's not as good as having it work, but we are working on it. Now, the last thing, and I won't go through all these in the interest of time, is that I've been doing work with modelers, and I gave some of this talk at a Warn on Forecast workshop just a couple of couple of months ago. And some things we can start doing with dual pole immediately as far as model verification, microphysics, I, I mentioned that. And there's a lot more that we can do soon with the new data. But a question for the modeling community, not just the Warn on Forecast, but the whole modeling community, is how are they going to use the dual pole data? Of course, there's verification. What you'd really like to do is you'd like to assimilate something. Are you going to assimilate the variables, the most native format? We've made that a, a decision other places. 
are, are instead are we going to assimilate the algorithm output, the hydro class, for instance? Um, can we really get to these drop and ice distributions? I think there's fabulous potentials there. I, I showed you a couple of diagrams that I think really show the potential. Uh, maybe those would be some of the best things to put in the model. That's, that's the purest microphysics if we can get those distributions or, of course, other stuff. So I think that was the end. Yep, that's finally the end. I'm still around. was part-time, but I have so many fun things to do. It's been full-time for a little while now. There's my phone number, my email. If you have a question, don't hesitate to contact me. Paul may tell you the same thing. Uh, and, and if we can't answer your question, we'll pass it along to some other people who I'm sure could. So if you don't have any other questions, I think we're ready to go to the break.
she visited these places and there talked with men, revealing the very secrets of heaven itself. because she visited these places and there talked with men, revealing the very secrets of heaven itself.
through a dual poll workshop uh, here. So Paul had worked uh, quite closely with uh, Don Burgess and those guys at, uh, in Norman, uh, but now Paul is uh, back at NOAA head, at Weather Service headquarters, and uh, he's there uh, on a permanent basis now. So I'd like to give you just a little bit of a background on uh, Paul, and then he'll start with a workshop. So let's take a look at that video. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. No audio actually streaming, so we'll play this again, but we'll just come out and resolve for you. Oh, right, right. Let sure. Ask you this too, Paul, when somebody mm -hmm. asks a question, if you could repeat the question, we can make sure it's online. And sure. Your okay. Understand what the question is. Thank you very much. So I'm good to get started? Yeah, so that was, uh, so I work at National Weather Service headquarters now, uh, kind of an executive advisor to the director of the Weather Service, Dr. Jack Hayes. I'm sure all of you heard of who that is. Uh, but for eight years prior to going to headquarters, I was in radar training. And obviously, I, I relish any chance I get to be able to come back and look at, look at radar images and discuss them with all of you. So what are we doing with this workshop? We're es essentially going to play a game of what is that? And by that, I mean we're going we're gonna to identify using the dual pole radar products what it is that it's showing and then hopefully get a, 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 a short discussions going on how that might improve uh, all of your jobs as broadcasters and in general, all for all meteorologists across the country. So I'm building off kind of what Don Burgess uh, briefed you earlier. I'm going to make this pretty interactive. I'm probably going to call some of you up to at least point at some stuff. So be aware of that. And, and obviously, I, I really help, hope you guys volunteer to do that kind of stuff, too. Now, the, the hard copy of the decision aid I passed, that uh, Dave passed around, you can use, we're, we can use that as a decision aid, and we'll go through that a little bit. I also tweeted, if you don't want to use a hard copy, you'd rather just go online and use a PDF version. I tweeted the location of that exact same document in electronic format. So we're going to apply techniques. All I've got are radar images. I've got roughly, I think, 13 or 14 different events all across the country from, from the upgraded dual pole radars. And so we'll apply techniques on how to, how to understand how dual polarization would benefit those types of events in that part of the country. And then finally, uh, ultimately, the, the goal in the, in the weather service, and also I'm sure the goal with all of you is, w why are we even doing dual pole? Really, the benefits are it 
really conveys a much more confident message to your viewers from the weather service pr perspective, a more confident message to our customers, the general public, emergency management, that we, we have, we're much more sure about what the radar is showing and are able to convey that in our, in our messages, particularly warning messages. So how are we going to do this? For each, each event that I'm going to go through, we, we will do, uh, I'll give a, just a really brief background on what type of event you should be expecting. Because we're, we're, we're here to view ra radar images. I'm not going to go into to the, to the weather background of each event. Uh, and then I'll show a, a series of radar images. I'll kind of go through the methodology of how a weather service forecaster would do it, and hopefully that you kind of see where, how, how one would inter properly interpret dual polarization. Use the decision aid. So we'll use that to hopefully identify uh, what, type of, what type of precipitation or non-precipitation we're looking at. We'll discuss the most likely type and then kind of review why, what the correct answer might be. So jumping right in, the first case we're going to look at is, comes from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, it was on November 9th. I don't need to discuss the sounding too much, but it's, a, it's kind of a typical snow sounding. So really, forecasters going into this event, they knew they were going to start off with rain because surface temperatures were in the 40s. And then, but it, as the cold air deepened from the north, they were expecting it to change over at some point. The trick is when and where is that changeover going to occur? It's kind of tough with computer models to nail that down to within an hour. I'll show you with dual polarization, you can nail it down to the minute and also the location of where it's changing over. So there, there, surface observations, Wichita is right in this area here. Notice that at this particular time, it's late in the evening on the 9th, mid four, uh, low, low to mid-40s temperatures. Upstream, it's upper 30s, and they're still reporting rain just about everywhere. Just showing a velocity image just to show you that, hey, uh, the radar isn't going to change. Reflectivity and velocity are still going to be there with dual polarization. But notice a uh, nice northerly flow with the, the green inbounds and the red outbounds. Nor northerly flow just about at all heights. So here's your reflectivity image, just, just to give your bearings. So the radar's here, Wichita. The bulk of the metro, metro area is right in that area. And so here's this massive batch of precipitation coming, moving from northwest to southeast. So on this particular image, uh, kind of focusing on, okay, there's moderate, we, with reflectivity, you know there's moderate precipitation going on in all these batches, but what is it? Is it rain? Is it snow? Is it a mix? With reflectivity, there's no way you're going to know. So let's look at, this is differential reflectivity. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind with differential reflectivity, strong positive values, so greens, yellows, reds, almost always going to be uh, large, larger raindrops or liquid precipitation. When you get down towards zero, the types of things that Don had mentioned and that I'll, I'll reiterate, get down near zero, probably hail, could be really tiny raindrops or drizzle, or snow. Those are the three type of options to think about. <coughs> so let me toggle between the two. So notice this heavy batch of precipitation on, on top of I-35. It's got higher differential reflectivity. So in your decision aid, uh, take a look at the differential reflectivity page. Does it mention what values above two kind of signify? Which one? Let's see, does it have it on there? The All right, let's do light to moderate rain. So we've got 30, 30 to 40 dBZ reflectivity and differential reflectivity between 2 and 4. Does that match up pretty well with light to moderate rain on everyone's chart? Roughly? And then uh, we'll, we'll get to it in a little bit. But so just behind this batch, so <coughs> note this whole area here to the northwest. Yes, reflectivity values are similar, but notice that differential reflectivity is effectively zero. It's between zero and about plus 0.2, that really dark blue value. And so we'll, we'll, we'll get to what it is in just a second. The final, uh, final piece of the puzzle to help determine precipitation type is this correlation coefficient. And the easiest thing to think about is when it's magenta, that's values above roughly 0 0.97, 0 0.98. 
there's only two things that could possibly be. It's either all rain or all snow. Nothing else, as any time you see magenta on this particular image, it's either all rain or all snow. It can't really be anything else. When you see values drop into the yellow range, which is uh, around 0.9, that's a mixture of precipitation, whether it be rain, hail, or rain and snow. It's a winter event, so we can rule out rain, hail, right? So where it's decreased in the yellows, it's a rain, hail mixture. Out here, it's either all rain or all snow. We're not quite sure which at, at this particular time until we go back to here. Now, with differential reflectivity down around zero, strong enough reflectivity and then correlation coefficient of point, you know, 0.99, so it's either all rain or all snow. What, what does everyone think makes the most sense? Is that all rain or all snow in this area? You got it. So, so he, just, he just touched upon how where the human, the human forecaster makes a huge benefit here. We know that where the radar beam is traveling, this is the closest to the ground, you know, closest to the radar, closest to the ground. So obviously, in this type of setup, closer to the ground is where your melting is going to occur. So you're seeing melting kind of in this 1,000 to 3,000 foot band is turning into rain there. Everywhere outside of that is turning into snow. So it is a little tricky figuring out, yes, it's all snow here. So what's, what's happening at the ground? You know, there's still two to 3,000 feet for this to fall through before it hits the ground out there. So that, that's always going to be a problem with dual polarization. You know, you know what it is at the radar beam. It's all snow. Below that, it's kind of tricky. You do know that it is melting closer to the radar in the lowest few thousand feet. So let's go, an, a, a good way to do this is to look, look on at a higher elevation angle just to see if there's a little bit better agreement of what's actually going on. And so again, remember, magenta means what? What does magenta mean? All rain or all snow. And then if you're into the yellows, what does that mean? Mixed, it's, it's, it's rain, snow, mix. So even at this, so we're looking at a 1.5 tilt, so this is a lo looking a little bit higher up. We're still seeing kind of a band of melting. So inside the melting would be rain, outside that, all snow. Let's, fly, uh, let's fast forward just a couple hours here. So what's happened? Now one of the sites, I think that's McPherson or Hutchinson, I always forget, Hutch. They are reporting snow, 34 degrees. Temperature in Wichita has dropped to 38 with, uh, with light rain. So the cold air has deepened a little bit. Now look at the reflectivity image. Using reflectivity, we know that there is heavy precipitation here and kind of in these bands up to 40, 45 dBZ. But still, we don't know what it is. Now the nice thing is it's right on top of Wichita. So we're only a few hundred feet off the ground. So there's almost without a shadow of a doubt dual pole, whatever dual pole says is here, 100 feet, 200 feet off the ground, that's hitting the ground. So is it going to be rain? Is it going to be snow? Let's take a look. Look at this little band right here. This is right on top of, what is that, 235 or 135? 135. Oh. It's all rain or all snow, right? Little pocket here too, right? Just just east uh, on I-35 there, out here. Yep, has to be snow. Um, when we can look aloft to verify it. So what you do is you'd look aloft, see if see in this little column if there's any melting going on just above that. Turns out there's not. So in this pocket, in this part of Wichita, you're identifying all snow, and it's actually pretty good snow. We're talking 40 dBZ. Those really heavy, kind of big, half dollar size flakes going on. Out here, same deal. It's about 900 feet off the ground here. Chances are that snow is reaching the ground as all snow. Even, even without, and of course, any type of viewers you have out there or spotters that are tweeting these things will be able to help, help identify, yeah, it's snowing here. And then you kind of know that all around there, heavy snow's going on. So toggling between these two again. So there is still some cases of a rain-snow mixture over Wichita. You notice it's in that yellow range, rain-snow mix right in that area. And then kind of the clincher, that same band that was really heavy, it's right around zero to 0 0.2. So on your, on your snow chart, go to your snow chart. We'll kind of look at that a little bit. Snow or dry snow? Yeah, we'll have to go to dry snow. And here's where it's kind of tricky. I'll, I'll explain. 
So the, each page was split up by how the algorithm that Don talked about, hydrometer classification, how the algorithm um, tries to figure out what precipitation type is. But to you and me as humans, wet snow means something totally different than what the algorithm's finding out. This snow here to the algorithm would be called dry snow if it was able to detect it. Um, in reality, though, it, the algorithm wasn't able to detect the snow here. It thought it was all rain. But uh, to you and me as humans, we, we think wet snow is that really, you know, the stuff that's great for making snowballs, right? Really, really wet snowmen, snowballs, those kind of things. To the hydrometeor classification, wet snow is a rain-snow mix. So that, it's w uh, one of the other reasons why I firmly believe a trained human can beat the algorithms with dual pole all the time in any situation. Just been able to determine what is really wet snow. So it's, that's really just wet snow that's all wet snow, not mixed with any rain in that band just north of the radar and on the northwest side of Wichita. We go a little bit further now and notice how, uh, how high the reflectivity got there. Again, before dual polarization, I'm not sure that you'd say that that was snow. I mean, how many times do you see 50 dBZ snow? Nor'easters, I'm sure you can see that occasionally, but again, High correlation, you see, now you see the batches of all snow, and we'll, we'll verify all snow with the next product, but just little batches east of the radar, and then there's still some rain snow mixed in different parts of the metro. So all over the metro, you're getting either all snow or then a rain snow mix. Now here, again, here's the thing that really verifies it. When it drops off to near zero, that's snow. When it gets higher, it's a rain snow mix. So I'll let you look at that just a little bit longer. So well, the nice thing is, if you have a radar located near a major metro area, which a lot of the 88Ds are, you are able to get this kind of resolution on where the rain and snow is falling across the metro area. Because you're only a few hundred feet off the ground with the radar. Chances are it's not going to change very much in those few hundred feet, particularly when you're talking really heavy, heavy stuff falling. Look in, I think this is just a little bit later, maybe a half hour later, just showing the evolution. At this particular time, there's only a few areas of melting that are still occurring. Everywhere else, it's turned completely over to snow. And again, how do we know that? Right here. As long as you've got the higher values mean rain snow, everywhere else where it's kind of that blue color near zero, it's turned over to snow everywhere. So to towards the tail end of the event, we're changing over to snow entirely. Oh, no, you can't see that too well, but this was on a mid-shift, so obviously they're having fun. There's snow coating the sign outside the weather service office, and they made a little smiley face on it. So it was really, it's that really wet, slushy type of snow that fell, and since it was 36, 37 degrees, it melted pretty quick. But uh, they did uh, other parts of their forecast area, and maybe, Jay, you remember that. They got up to two inches really quick, and... Uh, some of the uh, social media sites around the area that the weather service uh, was tracking had mentioned that people had a hard time seeing because when it changed over to snow, the visibility dropped really quick, and so they got a little worried about this kind of thing. So even though it was kind of a, in terms of snow accumulation, it wasn't that big of a deal to viewers who are driving or to people that are, that are trying to travel through this stuff, they hit a pocket of that heavy snow, uh, the conditions rapidly change and their visibility drops. So it's still, for travel, this kind of thing, I think, is gold. It's gold for winter weather, transition events, rain to snow, uh, for travel considerations. Let's move to, actually, fairly recently, December 19th in the Texas Panhandle. They had a, you may have remembered, they had a, a pretty good blizzard there. And this event also started out with rain and eventually transitioned into all snow. So... Texas Panhandle, at least the northwest part, it's already heavy snow, a quarter mile visibility, and a little bit breezy out there, if you like breezy and, uh, breezy and snow. Amarillo, 39, rain, so it's still raining, and then it's actually just, just a few miles south, it's in the 50s. So somewhere in there, it's transitioning into rain, snow. But where and when and what roads might be impacted by that? So here's reflectivity, and it kind of looks like a mess. There's, you know... Without dual polarization, I don't know where you'd say melting is occurring. Where is it rain? Where is it snow? It would essentially be impossible. But to get your bearings, here's Interstate 40, major travel artery east-west. They're expecting major problems there, but you know, who, we'll try and figure out where the snow was at the time. So here's correlation coefficient. So again, remember, magenta, it's either all rain or all snow. Where it's yellow, 
It's kind of a mixture, right? But this is hard to interpret. Even for someone who's looked at this stuff for years, it's hard for me to interpret. Kind of following a band around the radar, this is a clear-cut melting layer out here, but here it's kind of all over the place. It's probably melting, so you would first guess, you'd say inside the yellow is, a, uh, is all rain. Outside that is all snow. We'll need differential reflectivity to help. Now, these, these are from GR Analyst, and so it's the raw level two data. You'll notice it's quite a bit noisier. Uh, why is it noisier? Well, if you're getting the level two feed, this is actually super resolution. It's, it's half degree azimuth data, so it's, it's a lot noisier than what I was showing just a minute ago that the weather service uses. So something to keep in mind if you use this. If you get level three products, those will be uh, smoothed out quite a bit. But uh, even to me, this is a really noisy graphic to look at. But it, the vendors can improve by yeah. doing the same smoothing. Yeah, yeah, they could they could do similar smoothing. I, I just turned it off just to show just how raw the actual level two feed is, how how a messy it can be. But we we start to see patterns though. <coughs> Values are higher and noisy in the areas that we thought would show melting. So melting's going on there. In this area, again, where correlation coefficient decreases, transition zone, higher values. Higher values here. So in, inside the ring, though, it's kind of interesting. You notice the values are pretty low. So that's, wh that's where it's tricky. Because those same values we looked at at Wichita would have indicated snow. In this particular case, they're indicating really small raindrops, almost like drizzle. I'll show you why that is in uh, just a second. For that, we need to look aloft to be able to see a little bit better close to the radar where melting is actually occurring. That's what we got here. So reflectivity. If you remember signature called a bright band, I mean, I don't know where you're going to find it on reflectivity here. With correlation coefficient, pretty easy, right? It's a ring. So inside the ring, all rain, where the ring occurs, where it's, it's transition zone, anything outside the ring is all snow. So just by looking aloft, cutting that slice, uh, you know, cutting through the atmosphere a little bit higher, Within, say, a, a two or three county radius of the radar, we can pinpoint at exactly what height, using, you know, using inside of the ring, what height the melting is actually occurring, and you're getting a full transition over to rain. In this particular case, it's around 2,000 feet. Differential reflectivity shows something similar. We, we already sh proved to ourselves that it's all rain in here, so even though the values of differential reflectivity are kind of in that 0.5 or lower range, normally associated with snow in winter weather. We, we proved to ourselves, at least I hope that we did, that it is all rain in there. They're just really small drops. So going a little bit, little bit further in time, so th this was about an hour earlier. Let's move an hour later. What, what has happened to our ring? Definitely shrunk. And which, which direction did it shrink from? Yeah, isn't that pretty cool? So on the north, it's, it's not a perfect ring anymore. So the cold air coming from the north has lowered the freezing level locally north of the radar. South of the radar, it's still roughly the same thing. So what we're looking at is a sloped frontal zone. Much, much deeper cold air to the north, freezing or the melting getting much closer to the ground. Just in an hour's time, you're able to track that. So it's getting closer and closer to the ground in the Amarillo area, and in particular, this major travel corridor, Interstate 40. And that's what reflectivity looked like. So in that case, you, uh, reflectivity is kind of showing the bright band. You're getting 50 dBZ returns there, telling you that, that's, yeah, that's definitely a rain-snow mix. One hour after that, it's still 36 in Amarillo with rain. All these sites kind of have gone down. They're getting whited out by 40-mile-per-hour uh, uh, winds and heavy snow. But in the Amarillo area, still, still reporting rain technically. What's the radar saying, though? So here's, here's the lowest, lowest, degree, lowest elevation angle. So right here is pretty much just right off the ground, a few hundred feet off the ground in Potter County. Higher reflectivity to the east, north, east, northeast. That kind of looks like melting, right? And indeed, some of it is. But not all of it. Everything north and west of the radar all either it's either all rain or all snow and of course knowing we know as meteorologists we wouldn't necessarily even have to look aloft to know that that's all snow because we don't see any melting going anywhere with range so at this particular time 
in Amarillo in a long Interstate 40, it's transitioned to all snow. There's still a little bit of melting going on east of the radar. So any questions so far about what we're seeing? This is pretty fascinating stuff for uh, snow detection, rain snow line detection. And, and that's the thing. I mean, I'm showing you snapshots an hour apart. You're getting this transition zone as it moves across the area every five minutes. So you, you can provide updates. Hey, it's transitioning to snow in this area along that interstate uh, with a fairly high degree of confidence at what you're seeing. There's differential reflectivity kind of showing what we saw in the Wichita case. Once it gets down to around zero, zero point two, just barely positive, it's all snow. And then what's really good as well, I was telling Don before about with the ASOS out there, when you get these situations, especially with wind, it's very hard to even just determine from the ASOS what the heck is going on and this is a good way to kind of sift your way through where the rain and snow line is and what's really going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's all, this, is, this stuff is all about improving your confidence in what you're seeing. That's what we've trained the weather service forecasters, and we're hoping that trickles down to, you know, you guys increasing your confidence in what you're telling your viewers. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Could you just repeat the question? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, with ASOS, the automated surface uh, observations being the way they are, particularly in blizzard conditions, uh, it was a comment that, Radar will increase confidence that, you know, a ASOS may not know what, it, what you're seeing, but the radar will definitely be able to, to uh, uh, verify the transition to snow. So this, this was pretty neat. You know, this ended up being, that is a car buried in eastern New Mexico under four feet of snow, and the people were in there for 36 hours. They didn't panic. I was very impressed. So, uh, their cell phone was barely working. They called a friend who then called 911 for him or whatever, and then they, they brought out the avalanche poles, hit the hood of the car, dug them out, broke the window, and got them out of there. But, I mean, so travel concerns. Yeah, just figuring out where the rain to snow transition is, giving road crews a heads up on, yeah, it's, it's changing over here or it's still rain here type of thing. And especially for visibility, we saw that in the Wichita case. Yeah, it wasn't a lot of snow, but the visibility drastically changed when it went from rain to snow making uh, travel conditions a little bit more difficult. How about one more, win uh, well, I've got a lot of winter, winter storms, but this one was the start of the Groundhog's Day blizzard that I'm sure all of you were familiar with uh, just in 2011, almost a year ago now. The expectations, so the Weather Service and, and local media were, were expecting it to start as sleet, and at times really heavy sleet, changing over to snow, but the timing and the location of where or when that transition would occur <laughs> were pretty, it was pretty uncertain. And as you probably know, there are huge accumulation differences and road, road conditions and visibility conditions between sleet and snow. Uh, with snow, obviously, it accumulates faster, visibility is a lot lower, roads can get a lot worse when it changes over to snow. So figuring out when that happens would be a big bonus. So here's reflectivity. Again, this is winter, winter storm. We've got almost, there are a few pockets of 60 dBZ returns in there. The rest of it is kind of, you know, 40 to 50 dBZ all around the outside of it. And then it's a little smoother out there. So, you know, using Meteorology 101, Radar Meteorology 101, with before dual polarization, most of us would probably say, ah, that looks like a bright band. That's probably all a transition zone. Out here, it's kind of the reflectivity is smoother, it's lower, it's prob that's probably all snow. So what's in here? What do you guys think? Is it possible to have 60 dBZ returns whoop, with raindrops that are drizzle size? Basically, that, that would have to be drizzle at 60 dBZ. Is that possible? Drizzle rarely gets above 25 dBZ. So there's only one other thing it could be. Uh, check, your, check your dry snow chart. And some of these events kind of break those charts because I don't even know, how, do they even say reflectivity can get much higher than, yeah, it says reflectivity rarely gets above 35. But you'll see this. You'll see this in nor'easters. You'll see this in lake effect snows. What was going on in that band was heavily, heavily rhymed uh, snow, snow pellets or grapple that was occurring in there. I mean, ridiculously heavy, three inches per hour of this stuff. 
So you can see that in erasers. You can see it in uh, lake effect snow. There was lightning strikes in that area. So there was thunder, thunder grapple, thunder snow, whatever you want to call it. It was heavy, it was white, and it really, really hindered travel. And I don't know how you'd be able to tell the difference in reflectivity. It's outlined perfectly in differential reflectivity. So south of this kind of poly, this, this shape I drew, it's a melting layer. So under, underneath that area, it's, tur it's still sleet. In that band, I-40 just happens to go right through that band. Sorry, why did you make your dribble in comparison? Is there a question about it? Okay, so for differential reflectivity, there's only a few things that could be zero. Zero dB values, which is what these are, right around zero. Hail, which it's, it's winter, that's not going to be hail. Drizzle or snow. So we, we can rule out hail, look at drizzle or snow. Drizzle doesn't make sense at 60 dBZ. Yep. Let's look at correlation coefficient just to help us. So again, this says it's either all rain or all snow in there. There's nothing else that could possibly be. Outside, outside the shape, it's a transition zone. But everywhere, you can see where the cold air from the northwest came in. Everywhere northwest of the radar was indeed all snow. So this entire batch, everything, all snow. What about the grapple phases on here? Would, would that match your outline there? Yeah, it should. Yeah, look at the values of grapple. That goes up to 50, 55 dBZ, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that was an expense for me. So near zero dB. Correlation coefficient all the way up there, then 50 dBZ. That matches grapple really well, right, that Greg? Would be also the sleet would go with the grapple, is that right? Sleet's a little trickier. Um, actually, with this particular case, was one of the few times in all the radar data I've looked at, you, I, I, I thought I was seeing sleet on the radar. Problem is sleet refreezes so close to the ground, radar rarely sees it. That's part of the problem. Sleet would look like that should you ever be able to detect it, but I don't anticipate many events where you'll be able to see sleet because it, it just... Yeah, it refreezes so close to the ground. I mean, you might see it right around the radar, but then you've got clutter to deal with, and it's, it's just really tough. So that, that's why the meteorologist, the human forecaster, has such an integral role when interpreting these products. So since we know melting is occurring out here, below the beam, we don't have a clue what's going on. Well, we, you know, the, uh, an algorithm wouldn't have a clue, but as humans who did our homework, uh, know, knowing how cold that layer is, we have a pretty good feel if it's going to refreeze or if it's going to go as freezing rain or whatever. Um, so again, hu humans, th there's always going to be a role for us humans <laughs> in figuring out what's going on below the radar beam. Radars can't give us that. Where? Oh, yep. You got it. There are. Believe it or not, in Norman, there are some uh, blockages. One's a water tower. Two or water towers, one's the other radar, right, Don? This one? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the other radar, water tower. Wa they, they put the other radar on the same azimuth as the water tower. That's right. That's yeah. To the northeast, up to the, the water tower to the southeast, and to the northwest is the end of Peachtree and Cape Hill. Yep. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get radiated. <laughs> Again, it's a false radar. Yeah. <laughs> Very low doses. So this type of thing... Oh, yeah. And those areas where we have uh, beam blockages, if you go back to that last one, you'll see it also more suggestive. Yeah. For everything except Cape and Peak. Yep. So travel, travel, travel. In that band there that's set up and kind of stuck over the same area, they got eight, up to 18 inches of snow, which Oklahoma, that's, you know, that's the end of the world snow. Uh, it, it pinpointed the earlier changeover and where it actually occurred and gave, w would have provided a little bit of lead time on where that heavy snow band set up east of the metro. So any, any questions about what we just, the other, the, these last few events that we looked at for winter weather? You're starting to get a feel for the things to look for in the process for how to determine whether it's rain, snow, and, and where that is? So I've got, I've got I'm showing more, I'll, be, I'll show more events on that. Uh, I've got a Cleveland event coming up here pretty soon. Wanted to mix it up just a little bit. Let's get away from winter, winter weather and, and, and rain-snow uh, changeovers. Let's go to July in the Phoenix area. They, they were, this is kind of early in the monsoon season. They're expecting dust storms, severe winds, and then storms firing, firing along those gust fronts. So for something completely different, 
I put, store, I put the motion of these things together. So this one's moving out of the southeast. That one's out of the northwest. And then there's, you know, junk, whatever that junk is, and hopefully dual pull will help, as I'll show, junk all along and behind that boundary that are about to collide over Phoenix. So what does it look like? So correlation coefficient. Anywhere it's magenta, all rain or all snow, where it's kind of a yellow, it could be a rain-hail mix now because we're talking, we're talking warm season, not thinking snow this close to the radar. But tail of two boundaries. Look how different behind this boundary is. It's a much darker blue, which means much more randomly oriented things going on. I mean, that, that's a tornado debris sometimes will look like this. This particular boundary, a little bit higher values. So I wonder what's going on there. Differential reflectivity. This boundary maxed out positive. What do you think that could be? This one? It's not precip yet, though. It's not precipitation yet. There's no precipitation associated with that yet. We're really close to the ground. <laughs> Don, well, Don, the expert over there, uh, what, how do insects fly? They're kind of grasshoppers and things. They're horizontal, right? Locusts, yes. Could be a plague of locusts. Either way, it's, it's insects or birds. When you get the really strong positive values, you got insects or birds. And we've seen this. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. On these gust fronts that are moving, and I'm not sure why. Maybe they like the change in temperature. But insects and birds, well, if the insects are flying, birds are flying because they want to eat the insects. Yeah, I think the insects, you know, they're, they're not steering their own course. The yeah. wind moves them along. Yeah. The birds go where the insects yep. are because the birds like to eat them. Yep. And so, yeah, in any part of the country for... Most gust fronts will look something like this with really strong reflectivity returns and correlation coefficient that says it's not precipitation, it's, uh, it's biological. But this, this thing, this mass coming from the south, uh, southeast, completely different. In fact, these are ridiculously negative values, minus 0.4, about as low as you'll ever see on the radar. Turns out that this was the haboob. So... It gives you a, a different flavor of what, what is actually making up the gust fronts. And, and for that one, it was dust. But uh, research, I mean, I, don't, I haven't heard anyone that has explained what the heck that is, why it's so strongly negative. There wasn't any reports of lightning or thunder uh, from I inside the dust, which can sometimes happen, which might cause a negative ZDR. But it's, it's probably likely. It's likely there's lightning down there, yeah. You, you can electrify things and then orient targets. Right? Yeah, even without lightning discharge, right? That's what you're saying, yeah. Some people postulated, and Paul was a part of talking about all of this, you know, is that some people postulated that it's chaff. They do have chaff releases out there that are very, and you can map that, because that can be get oriented in a vertical way. In any case, it's, it's just a neat example of how dual polarization can loosely identify, well, at a minimum, tell you that there's something different about these two approaching gust fronts. Could you see the nature of the dust from the haboob? Uh, how, how can you have dust that's vertical? Yeah. Particles? Yeah. Particles I, I did a quick Wikipedia search. It's amazing what you can find on there. They, they had a zoomed-in image of dust, actual dust particles from a... Moroccan or uh, Sahara haboob. And based on that and all, all everything I read about dust, you'd expect ZDR to be zero because it's randomly oriented. It's all, it's all, you know, there's no preferential direction or shape to dust. It's just, it's dust. It's, it's, it's kind of like hail where it'll be roughly zero. In this case, it definitely was not zero. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so that that one was interesting. Any 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 questions on uh, on Phoenix here? <coughs> this is a really neat event because once those gust fronts collided, then convection kind of zipped all along it, and so you're able to to track where the new storms were forming all along that all along that collision. Did you see the video of this? Mm -hmm. It was crazy. <laughs> where did yeah. The reflectivity? I mean, the velocity. Oh, I actually I I, I didn't show it, but. I, I believe it was probably in the 40-knot range.
mean, it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna knock you over, but it's still you wouldn't want to be outside in that, particularly with the dust. All right. Ah, we have Washington State, the new Langley Hill radar. Which, yep, in September. Uh, unfortunately, you guys had a a pretty good uh, for you a drought in December, or not till the end, right? You finally got something. We're still dry. You're still dry. See, I, before coming here, I'm like, uh, the one thing I wanted was a really good winter storm in the Pacific Northwest, and it just never happened. So I was going to at least show something from up there, just to show that the same concepts that I've been showing other parts of the country still apply uh, to in the Northwest. So in September, obviously a pretty good uh, uh, Pacific storm with uh, towards the surface, more southerly flow, really strong too, actually, uh, and then once you go further aloft, it's more of a southwest direction. And we're talking 80, 90 knots, not, not too far off the ground there with this storm. So you see there's echo just about everywhere covering the screen. So let's, let's take a look at what dual polarization might tell us about the echo. So that's interesting. Just offshore in here. Correlation coefficient is in the blue range, which is around 0.5. So could that possibly be precipitation? What do you guys think? Is there any precipitation that, that falls into that blue range? Oh, I'm sorry. This is correlation coefficient. I'll, we'll get to differential reflectivity next. Yeah, for, for what, what I'm doing here is is it is it is it uh, <laughs> precipitation or non-precipitation? That's that's all. That's all. Since it's a warm season event, not too concerned about snow yet at this level. So it's either precip or non-precip. So in the blue area, is it precipitation? Can't be. You never see precipitation get this low in correlation coefficient. But everywhere outside that, where it's magenta, it's either all rain or all snow. And since we're talking September and you're already expecting snow levels probably as high as 9,000 feet. That's all rain. So that kind of takes the mystery out of, out of uh, if it's magenta, there's no mystery. It's all rain. So differential reflectivity, strongly negative in that offshore area. Everywhere else, it's, it's around zero. So, it, yeah, it's, it's roughly drizzle. You're getting drizzle. Well, although this fascinates me. So, okay, so it is a little bit higher in this band, differential reflectivity, which would indicate the drops are a little bit larger, higher reflectivity values. But what the heck is offshore down here that's not precipitation, but it's yet getting really strong returns? Yeah. Yeah. And negative differential reflectivity, again, that just, it just doesn't happen. It happened in that dust storm. Something really weird would have to happen to get negative differential reflectivity. Do you know the answer, or are you just throwing it out there? Just to <laughs> tossing it out there. We think we know the answer, right, Don? You're getting a lot better. Yeah, sea spray. Or the waves themselves, the tops of the waves themselves as they break offshore. So, yeah, so I, one of the applications of this is, at, at a minimum, these areas here won't get counted for precipitation amounts because it's, it's clearly not precipitation based on that. But for, from another aspect, you're seeing, uh, yeah, where the waves are breaking, where there's sea spray going on. There's sea clutter out there. So why, why there? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, that I don't know the answer to. It could just be the way the, the waves were breaking and the orientation to the radar. Yeah. South, right? Strong south. Well, if it gets ducted, it could just be it could be hitting the, it could be hitting the surface of the water. Yeah. And this also fascinates me. It's almost like you're drawing a line along the coast. There's not no sea clutter here, but there is along here. I, it's weird. Just interesting things that, that research would be able to, to provide. Paul, somebody was explaining, I can't remember now the explanation about in sea spray how you could get bird vertical marine particles. Yeah, I'd heard that, but that's interesting. Uh, I can't remember who was, who was offering that, but apparently it's possible, not, not the best, exactly what it is. But 
Mm -hmm. And they, they, they were seeing similar stuff off the Carolina coast with Moorhead City radar also, where they'd see this line of r higher reflectivity, really low correlation coefficient, and negative ZDR. So it's not, it's not restricted to just the Pacific Northwest. Apparently, whatever it is, when the beam in impacts the, the surface of the ocean where the waves are breaking and there's a lot of sea spray, you'll get signatures like this. So kind of fascinating. Other than that, though, outside of that, not much else going on. It's rain. Where there's, where there's heavier rainfall, the differential reflectivity was higher, just a little bit higher, indicating a little bit larger raindrops. The rest is kind of drizzle. Something I would point out, like, like I mentioned, for a different environment, those ZDRs don't get a whole lot higher, like you would expect in a hot climate. So this is it's a very moist environment, very high humidity, emphasis on larger numbers of smaller drops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maritime, maritime drop size distribution, a lot of warm cloud stuff. So let, let's look aloft. Maybe we can, I mean, in, in the winter, it, it's much better to look aloft because then you can really pinpoint where, where that rain snow line is transitioning, especially for the, the mountain ranges out there. Reflectivity would be pretty tough to find where that rain snow line is. But with correlation coefficient, really nice ring. It's actually constant height too, so... All you'd have to do is find out what height this is, what height this ring is around the radar, and that's where you're, that's where you're trained, that's where it's, it's all rain at that point. In this case, it was well over 9,000 feet. There was a case just a, a last week, mm -hmm. um, it was a weak storm, but um, we, the weather service was just talking about this in their discussion off this radar, showing the, the melting level and helping them with the uh, shifting anyway. Yeah, and that, that one of the things that, if, if you're interested in taking the training, which, and it's the same training that the Weather Service has gone through, uh, it, it's the module I put, to, put together. I always, I always tell them, you know, get a feel for, you know, the environmental conditions and then look aloft. Because if you're lucky enough to find a nice ring like that, you've got your answer right there, where the melting level is, where it's, where it, at what height it's transitioning to rain snow. It gets a little trickier in more complex events like that Wichita one I saw where there was no nice ring or Amarillo where that ring was kind of funny shaped because of the sloped frontal surface. So for non-weather echo, which is we saw the sea spray, we saw the dust, uh, but the potential is there, and I think Don showed this, you, the potential to really clean up your radar displays to just, if, if you wanted to, and I'm sure vendors will have already done this or are, are working on it, to clean up those displays so that you're not even showing the insects, the birds, the dust, you know, chaff, whatever, whatever might be out there. Using correlation coefficient and seeing where it drops off, you can really clean up your radar displays. And then that, how does that help you? For precipitation totals, you know, getting, getting, getting uh, amounts from clear air returns will be a thing of the past with dual polarization. Make sure you mention to the vendors you need two products, though. You need one that's still got that clear air reflectivity and velocity that are in. If you can use it, then another one that's just the precipitation. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get to some more. Go back to winter. Figured I'd show uh, an Indiana, Illinois event. Anyone from around that part of the country? Not, okay. But it's very similar to the other events we looked at. You're, you're expecting rain changing to snow. It's near the end of the precipitation as the cold air is deepening. And that's particularly uh, in northern Indiana. Very similar to Wichita. Temperatures were mostly in the 40s, so pretty tough to get snow there, but... You'll notice that in this area, mid-30s, then, then you're in the range of where it could be snow at the surface. And indeed, at least this site in Indiana, snow with rain kind of west of that. So you know, you know the radar is going to be interesting. Maybe, it, maybe it'll be able to show what the differences are. So at roughly the same time, here's what reflectivity looked like. And it's, so it's decreasing... This is correlation coefficient, so where it's yellow. Again, that's where the transition zone is. So almost everywhere you look, and we're a little ways from the radar. We're, we're probably three or 4,000 feet off the ground. It's still melting at this particular time, um, at least at that height. Let's go a little bit later. Uh, differential reflectivity, all strongly positive, indicating it's probably a lot of liquid in there. Further at range... Out here, it's, it's, it's at snow, but then you're, you're so far off the ground, it, 
what happens at the surface, probably you can't even really tell. Going an, an hour later, still, it's 34 in heavy rain here, and then 34 in snow, moderate snow there. The unfortunate thing with this event is, is that we didn't have a dual pole right here. <laughs> the radar's all the way up there. So figuring out what that is is a little trickier. Reflectivity is still in the 30 dBZ range. Now correlation coefficient has changed everywhere to 0.99, just in an hour's time. So without even looking at differential reflectivity, is that all rain or all snow? Just use your, use your meteorological sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have to be, because out here we're at like 7,000 feet. It's not going to be liquid out there, since it's, it's high everywhere. We're talking all snow there. And eventually it did, it did, so I didn't even need to show differential reflectivity in this case. If we looked at it, you would have seen that it was all decreased into the snow range. And they were getting some snow at the surface, but the thing is, they were, all, they were still getting surface reports of rain in certain parts of it. So, again, far off the ground in this particular case, it's a lot trickier to get a good feel for what the precip precipitation type will be at the ground. Questions? All right, here's yours, Betsy. Just actually about a week and a half ago, it was a rain, ex expecting rain and snow mix, changing over to snow later in the event. And this is, we're looking at the Cleveland radar here. So here's your, s yes, you, you just gotten it, right? Yeah. Just before Christmas. So uh, it's 36 in rain in Cleveland, 33 in rain, 36 in rain. There's, and then there's snow down here. So again, this will be interesting to see what the radar says. So here's your reflectivity. In here, we like seeing this here because it's so close to the radar. We should have a pretty good feel for whether it's rain or snow in that area. Out here, it's more like 1,000 feet off the ground. Might be a little trickier. In Canton, yep. Ah, so there's correlation coefficient. So what do you guys think? Is there snow in there? Yeah, right here, right? Nope. So melting all along here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, trust your instincts. Where it's yellow, you know there's melting. So since we're already 1,000 feet off the ground out here, it's probably going to go to all rain here. But in here, that could be an issue. So we need differential reflectivity to help us. If it's around zero, we know it's going to be snow in that band. Oh, that's lovely. Even though it's a noisy, noisy product. Notice how pretty clear cut that band on the lakeshore Betsy knew about, and then this band. It's all snow. Everywhere else, it's, it's going to be rain at the surface. Now, with reflectivity, would you ever been able to, to tell? Out here, probably. That kind of looks like a normal melting layer, but here? So right here in this northern Medina County. Medina. Medina. <laughs> tell I'm not an Ohio native. Oh, nice. Were you, was your house under this? Okay. 35 dBZ, all snow. Lovely event. Six inches. Not much everywhere else, right? So, yeah, again, you're getting a heads up on this band and on this band that that's snow. The rest is going to be rain. Fascinating stuff. Let's see. I go a little bit aloft because uh, there's a lot of clutter in the Cleveland area. That's what all these blanked out spots are. So I want to look aloft just to see, does it look a little bit different? Does it, does it look a little bit easier to see? I'm at the, the next tilt up. And it's very similar. So above that band, it's still all snow. You can see where there's melting occurring very close to the radar, but outside that, it's all snow. And same deal. Higher differential reflectivity, melting, more liquid. Where it's around zero, all snow. I'll go over this again. <laughs> so I don't know, I mean, Betsy, what do you think? Could you incre increase your confidence of where rain and snow is occurring in the Cleveland metro area? Yes, and I would also like to move it about 25 miles east into the snow belt where it was supposed to fall. Oh, yeah, gotcha. So again, forecasters, both broadcast meteorologists, weather service, increasing confidence where this stuff is going to be transitioning. 
How about some more warm season stuff? It's been cold for a while. Let's go to warm season. Go to the Carolina coast with Hurricane Irene. So you're going to see hurricane dual pole data. As Irene was approaching, they were expecting outer band supercells. Uh, hail is out of the question in this particular event. So, so why, why would I say that? When you look at these images, any decrease in correlation coefficient is not likely to be due to hail because hail shouldn't exist on these things. Any decrease in differential reflectivity should also not be indicative of hail, just be indicative of smaller raindrops, just because we're kind of ruling out the presence of hail with a tropical storm. So here, uh, I'll toggle between these two. There's velocity. You have a tornadic vortex signature with the, the really strong outbounds bounds right next to the really strong inbounds. Notice it's kind of in this, the outer band is moving like this. It's, I mean, it's kind of an interesting location for that to be. There's also some pretty good shear with that storm there. So, the, yeah, they, they had a tornado warning out for this. Because, I mean, you see that, you, you, better, you better issue one uh, for, the, for the benefit of everybody. But what about dual polarization? Notice right where that circulation signature was, there's a, a pretty steep drop-off in correlation coefficient down to about 0.9, which if you're looking at your charts if, at a rain-hail mix, that falls into the range of rain-hail, rain mixed with hail. But it's on, it's on the lower end. It's 40 dBZ, roughly. Lower correlation coefficient. Does it make sense that there would be hail coincident with a, a tornado signature? Usually, hail kind of falls on the, uh, on, the, on the fringes of the updraft. And plus, it's a tropical environment. We're not expecting hail. So not much else can explain what that signature might be. Differential reflectivity. It's, uh, it's not showing a whole lot. Again, w near zero would be hail or very small drizzle drops. Where it's increased, the drops are getting just a little bit bigger. Everything, everything there is fairly typical of a, of a, of a tropical system with tropical-sized drops. <coughs> not much evidence of debris. Yeah, not much evidence of debris, but I submit that we are seeing debris here. And s research and all the examples of, of debris that I've looked at has shown that in storms that are completely covered in rain. I mean, you're getting tropical rain right on top of that tornado, all around the tornado. When little bits of debris, and, and in this particular case, it's probably just peat leaves, pine needles, whatever else is out there, frogs, <laughs> as it gets lofted and coated in water, your, uh, your differential reflectivity will still remain somewhat positive because it has a little bit of a water coating on there. Um, other, other signatures on that day, now this is out in kind of right along the Pam Pimlico Sound, where I mean, a, a hurricane's approaching, there are, it's 9 o'clock at night, you're not going to get a spotter out there. So there's no way to verify that that really was a tornado. But other, other smaller supercells did hit something, did hit a town, and did get reported as a tornado. The signatures looked very similar to that one. So in this particular case, they had a tornado warning out for it, but had no way to verify it. In this with dual polarization, they're able to at least, you know, if they could send a team out there to verify that there is some tree damage, that would be one thing. But there isn't much else that can explain that signature other than tornado debris. And it, again, it's not big pieces of debris. It's little tiny pieces of, of either leaves or, or twigs or something like that. Yeah, and that, that was the other thing. It's not, it didn't just last for one scan. It was fascinating. And probably because of the really strong horizontal flow, whatever those little bits of debris were, you could track it for about 20 minutes as it, as it came, went, across the, went across the screen. Even though the circulation had died down, it was still, you know, 70 mile per hour winds from the hurricane was keeping that stuff aloft and you could track it as it moved, moved away. Which was another bit of information that kind of made us think that, yeah, that is debris in there. It just it wasn't just some spurious feature. So, Tornado debris, even weak tornadoes. So they, they didn't even know that was a tornado there. Probably too late to do a damage survey. Um, but it's not going to give you lead time because the tornado is already there doing damage before you see the signature. And it also, in most cases, needs to be pretty close to the radar. But uh, for forecasters, broadcast meteorologists, these types of signatures, and I'll show a couple more, really will increase confidence that what you're seeing is actually a tornado and not just some radar-identified signature. 
so that weather service forecasters are able to go from radar has detected a storm capable of producing a tornado to confirmed damaging tornado uh, with dual pole. Verification, we just saw that, that particular event right there from Moorhead City. They wouldn't have known that tor that was a tornado without this type of data, so they're able to, to at least get be a little bit better verification. And then one other thing that really uh, should help, say you've got a, a really, you know, like a Greensburg type tornado or uh, a Joplin type tornado, which in, t in the case of Joplin, they were getting reports pretty quick that massive damage was occurring. But in areas where maybe communication is knocked out, it's maybe an isolated place where, where reports can't get out, Weather Service and Broadcast Meteorology folks can see a debris signature and kind of know where the heaviest damage was occurring along the track. In the first five, 10 minutes after a tornado passes, that's when you got to get those EMTs and the, and the fire department keyed into where to go, where the heaviest damage is. So these types of things, though it won't be a bigger lead time, you'll be able to get those first responders in place quicker than you would uh, with before dual polarization. So this is now we're, we're now we're talking tornadoes, a very recent event just before Christmas, in a, you know, near CNN and, and the Weather Channel, near near your neck of the woods in Northwest Georgia. Did have a tornado watch, but it, it was a it was a quasi linear system event. So tornadoes were at least possible, minimal hail threat. So there's your we're looking at a, a line of storms. I mean, there's storms everywhere uh, around the radar near uh, Atlanta. So as, as forecasters, we kind of key in on little hooks in the data, hooks in the, in the velocity products. You're not going to see it in reflectivity because it's just raining everywhere, heavy raining everywhere. But we'll, we'll key in on some of these, these features in a little bit. So we want to look for debris. Always start with reflectivity. Always start with velocity. And then go to correlation coefficient. Again, we're right, we're right near the ground. I'm not sure... Is that terrain, guys, Atlanta experts? Is that terrain, or is there buildings out there near the Peachtree City radar? Is it terrain? Terrain and trees? Trees. So getting that close to the ground, this product is always going to be noisy. E even when they smooth it, it gets noisy. So it'll be tricky to identify if there's any debris. But at this particular time, that just looks like clutter. If you were to loop this, the clutter stays in the same spots, which kind of helps you understand that, yeah, that's probably not debris at that time. So nothing, it, it appears at this time, nothing's really going on. Differential reflectivity, it's all over the place. We're not, we're not too concerned about the presence of hail. So wherever the differential reflectivity is lower, it's just smaller drops. Where it gets higher, much bigger drops. That's kind of all that's really showing since it's all rain. Going a little bit later in time, that right there, we're right by the radar. It's a nice rotational signature, plenty of shear. That's uh, roughly 70 or 80 knots of shear. And then there's another one kind of right there with a little velocity hook. Interesting. Where is it located? Again, there's, there's no way you'd be able to pick that on a reflectivity, what's going on there. This thing's embedded there. That's embedded in that batch of precip. So who knows if that's a tornado? I would, I, I'm almost positive they had a tornado warning out for this. I should have checked ahead of time, but almost positive they had one out for those two signatures right there. Let's look aloft, because again, we're so close to the radar, even at the one, one and a half degree tilt, we're still not even a thousand feet off the ground. And that, that signature looks really good at this height too, and so does the other one. Move forward in time. Also like using, it, when you're this close to the radar, you're using a little bit higher tilt to get out of the clutter. So now, now this one looks really good. This one, still something there, pretty good rotational signature. Weak, don't get me wrong, they are weak. They're not going to, you know, embedded in heavy, heavy rain. There's no way anybody's going to see this uh, unless it's right on top of them, they hear it coming. Now there's something interesting. There's a little blotch right there, right where that tornado was. That's correlation coefficient, yeah. I, with, with this type of event, I don't even bother with differential reflectivity because, I mean, it's noisy. The clincher for debris is correlation coefficient. You have to have something that caused it, i.e. rotation, and then you have to have a lower, slightly reduced correlation coefficient. So right here, there's something going on there. 
Remember, it wasn't there before, so this is an area where clutter is not known to occur. Right there. How about the northern one? Northern one was right here. Yeah, so at least at this height, which we're about 1,000 feet off the ground, that one doesn't have debris, but this one almost definitely does. We could look at multiple tilts to see, you know, where did, how high does the debris extend? Is there any continuity? And sure enough, this one right here actually goes up to 5,000 feet. You could keep looking at higher tilts, track it. It's 5,000 feet high. This? That is uh, zero, kind of the zero isodop. Clutter filter. Clutter filter is removing that. So, yeah, that's another reason. Yep. So we got we have debris here, uh, and we go. Let's see how much later in time do we go? Yeah, n the next scan, next scan, that signature is still there in velocity, but on velocity here, there's a tiniest bit of shear left over there from the original circulation. There's your reflectivity again. It's 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 heavy rain everywhere. You're not you're not going to see these things. You're probably not even going to see the debris necessarily. But now, you can see the the little the elevated debris. Even though there's probably not a tornado at this time, given the velocity, there's still lofted debris. Little little bits of trees, uh, right there. But notice that one. Right on top of it, right. Debris. That, that, is, that is not a known area of clutter, so with that one, there's debris. And right now, we're roughly 2,000 feet off the ground. There is a tendency with some of these to issue tornado warnings that are for broad areas. One warning to cover a large area. I am not a fan of that. I think you ought to issue warnings for where we think the threat is. To prevent what's already a bad cycle of yep. clutter failure. What's the distance from the radar for those trees? Uh, like 10 miles. It's really close. Even at the one and a half degree tilt, we're just over a thousand feet off the ground. Really close. Paul, could you summarize the discussion? Uh, Don, what did you say again? It was. I, I said there's a tendency sometimes to issue one tornado warning to cover a large area for events like this, where we have uh, small, sometimes non-super failures. Mm -hmm. Right, so th there's a tendency to have larger tornado warnings to cover an entire area like this, but as we're seeing in this particular event, that they're actually really small, kind of short-lived circulations that are, that are the reason for this. And <clears throat> we're, we're about 10 miles from the radar, roughly 1,000, 1,500 feet off the ground. From the one and a half degree tilt, the, the half degree tilt's only a few hundred feet off the ground. It'll be ongoing. Yeah, as far as I know, I mean, they didn't even see these in real time. This was all kind of after the fact, after they were looking for places to do storm surveys. Uh, they saw one down here and sent it to, uh, there's, a, there's a list list server that, you know, people look at the radar images and kind of give feedback. Isn't that where you would apply your significant, uh, maybe a weather alert, significant weather alert? Or yeah, a statement, right. So had they seen this in real time, and, may, and maybe they did, but I mean, everyone's still learning. It's a, it's a massive learning curve. What they could have done is issued a severe weather statement for these saying, yeah, they confirmed debris in the air, uh, you know, located here. As it was, the main uses, I'll go a little bit further and show that you can still track these things. Yeah, and it's kind of embedded in clutter, but the, the trick here is time continuity. You can loop this and see that that little pocket of debris was moving along with the, the mean flow there. Even though there wasn't a tornado on the ground, there's still some elevated tree debris up there. There were, there were zero and one tornadoes confirmed, I think, in that area this day. Yep. Interestingly, that though farther to the north up there, there was a little gap in line segments, and there was a, an EF2 and EF3 tornado. Yeah, so uh, Greg, Greg was saying that north of the radar, uh, there was EF2 and EF3 tornadoes that much longer lived. I looked at the data for those, and I, they were just a little too far from the radar to get debris. I never saw any debris. It was only these little weak ones really close to the radar did I ever see any debris. And so from a usability standpoint, I mean, well, how useful does that type of signature, is that type of signature? The signatures are so short-lived. Uh, so in this particular case, 
It was used mainly to go to know where to, where to do a storm survey. Sure enough, both of those were associated with really short-lived, one-mile path length, mainly tree damage. Uh, EF, EF0, EF1 tornadoes. So, in there, so there is even a utility for post-storm analysis. You kind of know or have a better understanding of where to send teams out to look for damage. Uh, obviously, for weaker tornadoes, it is very beneficial to have them nearer the radar so you can actually see the debris from them. Can you comment briefly on why Don said that the cutter focusing on creates a bias in the coalition network? When clutter filter is applied and it removes the reflectivity signal, all the dual polarization products are, are loosely based on the return signal. So once it gets low enough here, the estimates for the dual polarization products just get really bad. You want the stronger the signal, the more accurate your dual polarization products will look and behave. Because it removes so much signal in this area, you can't trust the dual pole products at all in there. Just in that area or through the whole product? No, nope, just, just where it, the power gets reduced. And you can see in reflectivity where it's being reduced. Yeah, and I did, and so Greg asked if the microbursts have ever been looked at. Norman had a, a ridiculous microburst. It was EF1 damage, roughly, Don. High-end high EF1 damage, very close to the radar, so the radar scanning a couple hundred feet off the ground. Problem is clutter. Very hard to tell the difference between clutter and debris. The other problem is with microbursts, um, because the debris in these two cases, most likely, you know, so the tornado churned it up, and then it got ingested in the updraft. The updraft takes it and runs with it, and you can see it. Microbursts, it's almost all downdraft, so all the debris is confined pretty close to the ground. So I have yet to see a straight-line wind event or microburst that has kicked up debris. I'm not saying it's not. It, it's possible, but it's, it's, in my opinion, pretty unlikely to see any debris from those. I mean, that was a, that was a prime event where that... That Norman microburst, there was, was zero visibility in dust and leaves and debris. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't pick out debris from it on the radar. We, we had a lighter one, a slightly longer one, the south ground of the radar, later this fall, a big one. And there was some indication of, of light debris. I recall in the downburst, not a micro, in the, the broader feature probably had some of the particulate matter Yep. I'll, I won't spend too much time on this one because this one, not that any radar image is boring, but <laughs> this one is a little bit more boring than the others. It's just a typical average thunderstorm in eastern North Carolina. There was a watch out for just, you know, the t up to two inch hail, 70 mile per hour winds. No supercells expected, just kind of multi cells. But uh, so if you want to go to your, uh, that handout I gave and go to the rain hail if you want to follow along with this one, the hail, hail detection. So how, how, do we, how do we detect hail with dual pole? Well, as with any, before dual polarization, you'd obviously look for higher reflectivity. So we'd restrict our focus to kind of these areas where there's higher reflectivity. And it's, I'm, we're mainly focusing on this cell. So we'll look at the higher reflectivity and toggle to differential reflectivity. And so again, what values are you looking for for hail? What, what does it say on there? Differential reflectivity. What values does it say on there? So uh, and for and that so the higher values mean it's the hail's completely coated in water, which means it's almost completely melted. Probably won't reach the ground. Definitely won't be severe. So, uh, <coughs> though there probably is, there could be some hail in there. We'll look at correlation coefficient next. Anywhere there's high ZDR, you know the values above two, above three, that stuff is mostly melted hail. Probably won't reach the ground. If it does, it's going to be small. But we want to look for the zero, values near zero, the much lower differential reflectivity values, which means all the hail and rain or whatever is in there is mostly spherical, which means that the hail has lasted long enough that it's not this, you know, this ice core raindrop. It's mostly hail. So, there, so we're able to detect to pretty good spatial resolution where the actual hail shaft or where the hail is most likely to reach the ground in a storm. And this is for North Carolina. All right, 
specific differential phase. We hadn't looked at this much because it's the real utility here is in warm season and it's KDP to me, uh, you know, understanding the, the details of it, not that important. Easiest thing to think as values increase, heavy rain. Ra rain rates increase as KDP increases. So even in here, this whole area has really heavy rain, but I don't know if you can see, there's a distinct minimum in differential phase, specific differential phase. It's, it's, it's about in the one, one, one degree per kilometer range. Coincident with the low ZDR, coincident with the high reflectivity, which means it's, there's not a lot of liquid in there to explain the high reflectivity. It's mostly hail. So again, without much water, that hail's probably gonna reach the ground right there. or really large. I'll show you. We'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a much more interesting hail case. So correlation coefficient should decrease where there's hail present, and sure enough, it does. It gets around the 0.95 range. On your chart, that's squarely in the middle of where hail should be. So all signs point to hail in that little pocket of that storm as a whole. The rest of the storm, probably you wouldn't need to worry too much about hail reaching the ground. It's mostly rain at that time. So detect pockets at a local level, get a much better handle on if hail is melted or mostly melted. Size estimation, it's going to be promising, and I'll show why that is next. Going to more of the, 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 the big bad storms of the plains. Two events, both, both from May, both from central Oklahoma. Um, tornado watch, both particularly dangerous situation tornado watches. You're expecting supercells with giant hail, long track tornadoes. So here, here's the case right here. Differential reflectivity is actually negative or near zero in there. And notice where it's located. So reflectivity is saying, yeah, it's high. It's 55 to 60 dBZ. <coughs> but your differential reflectivity is, is ridiculously low. Very interesting. So what the other piece of the puzzle, correlation coefficient. You guys still have your hail chart open? Gets down to 0 0.8 or 0.75 correlation coefficient. What, what range is that in on there? Gigantic hail. The only thing that gets this particular product holds for Rayleigh scattering, which is when the, the particles that the radar is scanning are roughly you know, small enough or comparable to the wavelength. When you get gigantic hail, this breaks down and the product will decrease rapidly into the, the greens and blue ranges, which is around 0 0.8, 0 0.75. So biologicals or large hail would make sense here. Biological scatters in near zero re differential reflectivity don't make a whole lot of sense, particularly in a supercell where there's a, you know, precipitation is heavily falling there. The hook echo is right here. So the updraft, the edge of the updraft is right along here. So from a human perspective, the largest hail falls right, you know, right either in the updraft or just on the fringe of the updraft, right in this area. So incorporating your knowledge of storms Giant hail makes sense here in those areas. Uh, they, they got f uh, four and a half inch hail out of this crashing through, actually bigger, I think it was five inch hail. In this pocket here, as it crossed I-35, it went through more. So verifying that it's possible to key in on where those, I mean, that, it's, it's almost life-threatening. If you get hit by one of those, you're not gonna have a very good day. So for life-threatening hail situations, dual polarization has really strong promise. You're not going to think that giant hail exists here. Reflectivity looks pretty benign. With dual polarization, you can possibly say that. Does anyone see debris on this particular image? So here's velocity, correlation coefficient, differential reflectivity. So pretty easy to pick a debris ball out there. Reflectivity, would you be able to pick it out? No, nah, not so easily. And on the ground, would you be able to see that tornado? What do you guys think? No way. Look at this. 50 dBZ surrounding the entire tornado. You're not going to see that. Radar sees it. You can track it, find where the debris is. Lots, lots, of, lots, of, lots of important things uh, that can come out of that. So complete confidence that you're seeing a, 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 pr probably an extreme tornado given the rotation and the debris signature there. Here is, uh, we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit more on uh, a similar supercell. So we're focused here. Check velocity first. Where there's rotation, let's look for debris. 
Here's the hook of the supercell, so it's kind of on the tip. It's right where you'd expect the rotation to be. So restricting our focus here, we need to see if there's going to be any debris. You guys think there's debris there? Let me go back. Right here. Debris. Yes, yeah, so you're looking maybe right there. Yeah. So here, there, here's where it gets a little tricky. In really weak signal like that, correlation coefficient can have some problems. So even though that might look like debris, it's actually not. It's just weak signal. The debris would be in this hook part. And at this time, there's not. What I should have told you is that this was the first time the circulation really got going. So the tornado had just started on, the tornado just formed on the ground. We're 4,000 feet up. It didn't have time to loft debris yet. The next scan, as I don't have it, but the next scan show a massive area of debris associated with this. So there's a lag time. Tornado forms, even though it's on the ground doing damage, there is no debris. It's because we're 4,000 feet off the ground. So you always got to be a little bit careful, you know, putting complete faith in detecting debris because there is going to be a little bit of a lag time. Let me go to something that's really neat. I think I've got a, yeah, I've got a few minutes. Something we didn't necessarily expect. This is from the same case. So here, here's the, the big bad tornado, nice debris ball. Here's the damage track coming right, headed right for the radar. There's the velocity. I mean, it, the, it's, it's, sampling, it's actually sampling the tornado. We're seeing the tornado on radar. Then kind of goes this direction. There's still the hook, the rest of the supercell. But the, the rotation's completely gone. So the tornado, tornado picked up, nothing left of the tornado. So there's still, you know, all this precipitation, right, from the supercell. As it moves over the radar, continues, continues on that direction, and then all the way up there. There was no tornado associated with it. The velocity was saying it, it had lifted. But watch what happens. So this entire blob of reflectivity, I don't know that we would have ever thought that this entire thing is debris. Everything out here is debris. Where when you start to get again to the, the more magenta color, that's when precipitation is more likely. So this entire blob of reflectivity, debris. Watch how the debris fans out. That whole thing is debris. On top of the radar, debris. That still debris. Tiny bits of debris, that's, that's the key. For something to be lofted for a half hour, even in a severe thunderstorm like that, it's got to be little pieces of paper, like a piece of a yearbook, pieces of insulation, pieces of grass or leaves or twigs, just slowly falls out. You know, the, that stuff falls slower than a raindrop in most cases, if it's the really light stuff that just kind of trickles to the ground. And numerous reports, including Don, uh, Don and Jim can verify, who lived in Norman at the time, Numerous reports of just these pieces of debris from that EF4 tornado was, were falling 30 minutes after the storm had, had done it. The second, the second storm to the west, right northwest Norman, debris falls from it. Right? Yeah. Deep south behaves the same way? Yes. Very low correlation coefficient takes forever to fall because it just kind of wafts its way down. So just things we never thought of, that a half hour after a tornado dissipates, we can still see and detect debris and give people a heads up that, yeah, debris is going to be, it's going to be small debris and not, not pose much of a threat, uh, but it will continue to fall out of a storm. Let's go to one heavy rain event, and then I'll wrap it up. So this is the last one I'll show. It's from Pittsburgh in, uh, in August. They were, the office was expecting heavy rain from somewhat organized storms. They weren't necessarily expecting tropical light convection. There wasn't a tropical remnants or anything like that. It's just It was a moist environment, lots of heavy rain expected. So Pittsburgh, as you know, a very hilly city. city. There's clutter, clutter issues all over the place. So it, 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 looking at the lowest cut can be pretty noisy. But this is what it looked like. So the heaviest reflectivity is kind of along this band here. And that particular band right on top of Pittsburgh, kind of at near the downtown area. I saw the Tebow back there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so uh, prop, there, there could be some hail in there, but it's tough to, again, it's either all rain or rain hail. 
where it's magenta, it's all rain, where it's kind of dropping into the 0.995, it would be rain, hail, mix. But with clutter, it's kind of tough to tell the difference. It, it, does, it sure doesn't look like there's much hail in there. It's probably mostly rain, even though reflectivity is high. Differential reflectivity, if, if the hail is going to reach the ground, you need to have reduced values. It's on the, if you still have your hail chart open, that whole area is 3 to 4 dB of differential reflectivity. So if there's hail, it's completely coated in water, probably won't reach the ground as hail. It's just going to be a lot of heavy rain. KDP, higher values of KDP mean what? You remember? KDP is good for one thing, heavy rain. So when you get to the, the greens and the oranges, that means really heavy rain. So, and that's really heavy. That's, that's up to five, which translates into roughly like eight inches an hour rates. So it's, it's, it's dumping right on top of downtown Pittsburgh. It's dumping in this area too. Problem is, These are actually moving. That one is not. So I'm going backwards, now I'll go forwards again. So in five minutes, in 10 minutes roughly, that hasn't even really moved. That rain has really decreased. Go forward again, one more scan. Still hasn't moved. Eight inch per hour rates. Still hasn't moved. Right over downtown Pittsburgh. Yeah, everywhere else, for the most part, it, it's moved. Still hasn't really moved. And again, it, this is where KDP is really going to be your friend for heavy rain events. Yeah, there's, there's lots of areas of reflectivity, 50 to 60 dBZ. But it really pinpoints where the heaviest rain is falling. And so you can focus your efforts on those areas. So this is roughly a half hour after it started. We're still getting very high rain rates in the, in the 3 to 4 inch per hour finally starting to decrease in that area. So I think they really, I think what verified, if someone can correct me if they knew about this one, I think they actually did get three inches in a 30 to 40 minute period. And the water rose, led, led to a fatality uh, in that area of Pittsburgh because it just rose so fast. But using, using KDP when you're expecting heavy rain, it gets you to really pinpoint where the just Instead of looking at a, a kind of a messy reflectivity picture where different rain rates might occur, KDP tells you, hey, focus on these areas. That's where the heaviest rain is going to be. Any questions on heavy rain? I won't even look at that one. Getting ready to wrap up. But So KDP doesn't care if there's hail in there. It's only measuring effectively how much liquid is in there. Uh, in, in the face of uncertainty, so when, when you're not sure if there's hail, when you're not sure if it's a tropical-like environment or a larger drop environment, KDP doesn't really care about that. So for heavy rain detection, that's, that's the thing you want to try and focus on. Don put this uh, website up. It's a, a H should be on the outreach. But that particular course is designed for broadcast meteorologists. So what it is is... Um, it's an introduction overview, kind of giving you a feel for what to expect as you go through any training and uh, geared towards you. And then for, and I'm sure all of you would, are much more experienced than, than, than most people, you'd want to take the actual, the full version of the training, which is kind of what I just went through. It's kind of more advanced techniques. It's how to detect hail, how to detect debris. And, and that's all part of the training. Yep, I'll leave it up for a while. So any, any questions? I'm kind of curious to hear what you guys think uh, about if you'd ever show this on air, if you'd ever show a dual polarization product on air. Yeah, Paul. Seems like a lot of the examples were fairly close to the adopters. Yeah. Is that the yeah, and that's true. Of even before dual polarization, that, that's true. I mean, who knows what happens below the beam? The, the real advantage here is once you, get, once you get close to the radar, the lowest 1,000 feet, chances are whatever you see at the radar is not going to change before it hits the ground. So that's why I kind of stuck to close to the radar. At far range from the radar, you can still detect what the radar is seeing, but 4,000 feet, that could, could and probably will change quite a bit more. So th at further range, these types of techniques would have to be taken with a grain of salt. Paul, if I could add. Yeah. Doing any research, you have some ideas about maybe taking the data close to the radar Heard about it, and they get down a little bit like that. So, we would 
I'd go further than that. I, I mean, 50. Yeah, out, out to 50 is when, I mean, we, we see even weak EF1s can produce debris out to 50 miles. Uh, not all of them, of course, but we, I've seen it out to 50 miles for EF1. So. Yeah. 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 Well, right now, you've got the different <coughs> DCP, depending on you know what you're looking for and stuff like that. If you're going to be that type of thing in dual pole that deals with the algorithms and also like topical versus non-topical rainfall, where you've got lots and lots of small drops. Yeah. So you, you're asking about volume coverage patterns and if they're going to be modified for oh. dual polarization or more. Yeah. Yeah, the, so dual polarization QPE products are still a work in progress. They, they, they seem to do best in deep, deeper convection where the melting level is, is a long ways out there. And with KDP, it, KDP doesn't care what size the drops are. It's, it's really measuring how much liquid is actually there. It gets you a better rain rate. So that's nice. So dual polarization products shouldn't depend on drop size distributions, whether it's tropical or continental. Yeah, it, Bessie asked that. It, I'm a little disappointed that the that Weather Service doesn't have it yet. And I'm not even sure when they're going to do it. It might be later this year at the earliest. But vendors, I mean, if you have a, I mean, I get it, I get it on my uh, Android through a, not, not that I'm plugging Radar Scope, but I use Radar Scope, and it's got the full suite of, of dual pole products for all the radars nationwide. Okay. All those images I showed were Gibson Ridge. So if anyone has GR Analyst, you can get it that way, too. And your data source for that is? Uh, scope, radar scope, right? I, get, I get my level 2 data just from the free Iowa State right. site. Yeah. But even the dual pole stuff comes from there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if a radar has dual pole on, on that craft site, the, the radar site, it'll be in there. And was that GR2 or was that level 2 or 3? On that? that was level 2. Yeah, now, and I did hear he was, he was making his own algorithms to kind of match it, but he, I haven't seen him yet. There is also, I don't know if you've seen on GR3, uh, yeah, it, it's in there, though. These products are in the level 3 feed, so if you get a level 3 feed for any, any of the dual pull radars, it'll be in there. Okay, there you go, yeah. Which will be smoother, a little easier to interpret. That's true. Same thing the 88D is doing, or, or have they? Yeah. Them? Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I was just wondering why you didn't use the KDP in the winter cases. It looks like according to the charts that it would be helpful in you know, differentiating between heavy rain and heavy snow. Yeah, so in KDP in winter precipitation, in my experience, just gets really noisy where you'll see pockets of higher, lower, higher, lower. I just never really saw the utility of using KDP there. Correlation coefficient, differential reflectivity kind of kind of gets it every, almost everything you need. Uh, and so that's why we have, I, I didn't really, it's, it's such a noisy product and I don't, I don't even know how to interpret it for winter weather. <laughs> even though it may say, I mean, the, a lot of those are based on research and maybe we tweaked them a little bit. But for me, I, I'm not a fan of KDP in winter weather. I totally see on air possibilities for yeah. correlation coefficient and KDP, absolutely. The others, I think it would just be more off air verification. Type yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you can show viewers, hey, this is debris, they get that. It would mean something to them, right? I mean, I, that, uh, my hope is that it would elicit such a strong reaction in them that, hey, it's saying there's debris that they, they take cover. Well, we had that, that Good Friday tornado and, the, and its pronounced debris ball. Mm -hmm. And I've never heard the Weather Service go off on debris balls. Yeah. Using 
verbiage that they've never heard before. Wow, that must be serious. And we, I would see us using uh, a product like that, much like we do velocity, more often than not. Mm -hmm. There are times when we have a little time to fill that we talk about inbound, outbound, but many times we'll just use the blotch and say that point right there is what we're watching. Okay, I don't have time to get into why. Just know that that's, that's our focus right now. Um, and that, in that way, operationally, obviously, it's very, very useful, but even visually on air. It's, it's yeah, and I'm really confident inside of 50 miles roughly that the high-end tornadoes, you, you will see debris. There, uh, there's almost no question in my mind. You will see debris from the high-end tornadoes. Yeah. Yep. That that tornado I showed in May had debris up to forty three thousand feet off the ground. And it was an EF five. Yeah. And so I would Joplin. I bet any one of those would have had debris similar to that had it been dual pole. Now, research wise, what what would what would a, a product like that? What benefit might, might that have if somebody goes back and and tries to um, determine how much debris would that's exactly what I just reviewed a paper from NSSL OU and he looked at all those debris signatures to see well does it correlate to where the EF4 EF5 damage was and the size of the debris how low the correlation got and it turns out that it, it, it he did find a pretty good correlation when correlation Gosh, I'm using correlation way too much. When the product correlation coefficient has a larger area and a much lower value, that corresponded to much severe damage at the ground. Now, it still doesn't give you lead time, but it's the same deal. You see that signature, you can get on the horn to your first responder saying, th there could have been an EF4, EF5 right here five minutes ago. Because roughly there's a, there's a five to ten minute lag between when Tornado does that damage and the product really decreases. But that, those first five to ten minutes are crucial. You could send your crews right there to where the worst damage is thought to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you can say that's probably an EF4, EF5, or at least damage char characteristics of it, that would say something. Th those are first results. So you have to be right. careful. Qualitatively, we can say it's bad. Yeah. And this trend of this being able to look at the negative data and say, oh, yeah. yeah he needs to look outside of Oklahoma, too. All his cases are in Oklahoma. I, I, just because whatever tornadoes churn up has a little bit different signatures. David, yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah. Little, little. S mm -hmm. Yep. This is great. This, this discussion is terrific. And, um, Paul, you're going to be here until Friday? No, oh, unfortunately, I have to go back tomorrow. But all, okay. all day, I'm not going to go skiing, okay. so I'll be around today. So, Paul will be around all day today, and mm -hmm. I did want to remind, too, our online viewers that um, both Paul and Don Burgess will be back at 1.30 Mountain Time uh, to sit up here and answer some questions live uh, from the online uh, audience. So that's uh, terrific. And um, I just want to thank, you know, Paul for a great workshop. Thank you very much. I also wanted... up here and uh, the two HD cameras in the back that are allowing us to uh, you know we would have had to cart a lot of stuff out here to uh, to make this happen so uh, image audio visuals for this uh, equipment and service and they're both in uh, Colorado and nationwide so uh, tomorrow we'll have a full screen uh, banner up so if anybody uh, here or online wants to contact them uh, they can do that and also uh, just to remind everybody that tomorrow uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Greg Forbes uh, from the Weather Channel, uh, who will talk about the incredible 2011 season uh, and the, uh, the severe weather, uh, so many billion-dollar disasters that we've had. Uh, also, uh, Bruce Thomas will be here with Midland Radio. And uh, as you know, uh, no weather radios are very important. You probably promote that on the air when you're doing your weathercast. Uh, I think uh, Bruce is going to have a few words to say about no weather radio as well. And uh, also Dan Leonard from WSI, who's going to talk about seasonal forecasting. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. We hope the uh, first day of the online stream was uh, 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 hopefully painless uh, for many of you uh, out there. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. 
So thanks very much, and we look forward to seeing you all uh, here tomorrow.
I'm Dale Leck. I'm the director of our The NEXRAD radars stand tall, scanning
Open your minds, your hearts, your very souls, good people. Open your minds, your hearts, your very souls, good people, to what you are going to see and hear. I'm Dale Leck. I'm the director of our Global Forecast Center here at the Weather Channel. I've been here 25 years. I started out as an on-camera meteorologist coming out of Penn State University with my bachelor's degree. And I've seen a lot of extreme weather over the past 25 years. What got me into meteorology? I love snow, but through the years I've seen plenty of severe weather outbreaks, flooding events, as well as hurricanes and all of those weather phenomena really grab my interest, including the extremes in temperature as well. This week, I'm going to be leading each day by giving a weather briefing so all of us can interact on what weather we expect over the next several days out to 10 days and how the weather might affect us here in Breckenridge. I'm Dale Leck. I'm the director of our Global Forecast Center here at the Weather Channel. I've been here 25 years. I started out as an on-camera meteorologist. Weather Channel. I've been here 25 years. I started out as an on-camera meteorologist coming out of Penn State University with my bachelor's degree. 
and I've seen a lot of extreme weather over the past 25 years. What got me into meteorology? I I'm Dale Leck. I'm the director of our Global Forecast Center here at the Weather Channel. I've been here 25 years. I started out as an on-camera meteorologist coming out of Penn State University with my bachelor's degree. And I've five years. I started out as an on-camera meteorologist coming out of Penn State University with my bachelor's degree. And I've seen a lot of extreme weather over the past 25 years. What got me into meteorology, I love snow, but through the years I've seen
Open your minds, your hearts, your very souls, good people. Open your minds, your hearts, your very souls, good people, to what you are going to see and hear. Check one, check two. Check, check. Check one, check two. Check, check, check. But everybody has a good flight getting here. Check. <clears throat> when I was three years old, we good? We're good. We're good. Well, when I was three years old, we moved to the eastern shore of Maryland.
And welcome back, everybody. Uh, for those of you that have been watching the uh, Weather and Climate Summit here at Breckenridge Online, uh, I am uh, Dave Jones. I'm one of the uh, co-organizers of the uh, Weather and Climate Summit out here at Breckenridge. And uh, we're trying something very new. We have never done this uh, at a Weather and Climate Summit before. Uh, we're bringing back the speakers from the morning session. And uh, those speakers uh, can then answer direct questions from you uh, out in uh, any part of the world that you may be connected from. So uh, we have just a couple of ground rules. Um, one of the ground rules is we would like you to identify uh, where you're asking your question from. Uh, are you in Los Angeles? Are you in uh, Washington, D.C.? Are you in Norman, Oklahoma? Uh, we'd like to know that. And then uh, Sarah Maxwell, who is our uh, social media uh, streaming um, expert here, will uh, then read out the questions that you ask online. And we have uh, Paul Schlotter from the National Weather Service and uh, Don Burgess, uh, who both spoke about dual polarized uh, Doppler radar. So uh, I'm going to um, uh, turn it over. Sarah, you don't have a, you don't have a microphone, but uh, Robert, can you hand Sarah the microphone that you uh, just, that I just handed you? And then Sarah can ask the questions that she sees uh, online. So uh, the first thing, before we go to any questions, uh, Don and Paul started talking about something uh, interesting uh, before we went live. And I said, hey, hold on to that. That was, uh, that was a great question. I think some uh, folks might like to hear that. So Paul, go ahead and uh, ask that question of Don. Yeah, so the question is that uh, someone in Paducah was asking, okay, so where and when did the, the term debris ball first come about? I've done a search on this recently because I had a question from a friend, Ron Prisbelinski, from the St. Louis Weather Service Office. And there is an old time paper from the early 1960s, authors' names are Garrett and Rockney, where they saw what we now call a debris ball in reflectivity. They called it an ASC, A-S-C. And they attribute it to possibly being associated with debris, but they so, so they identified it, but they didn't call it debris ball. Then the second paper is one that I did with co-authors looking at data from the May 3rd, 1999 tornado in central Oklahoma in weather and forecasting, the special issue on May 3rd, where we called it reflectivity ball, and we definitely attributed it to re reflectivity and studied it. But uh, to transition from debris ball to reflectivity ball, that has not occurred for the last couple of years, and it has appeared in a number of places almost simultaneously. That sounds great. Well, thanks very much, Don. And, uh, let me just ask you, just for the audio, when you're asking, answering, uh, just try to hold the microphone a little bit closer to your okay. mouth, uh, just so we can get a good, uh, a good picture. So uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Sarah Maxwell. I think she has uh, an online question that she'd like to pose. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, this question comes from Josh Trostel from the Severe Storms Research Center at Georgia Tech Research Institute. Uh, he has a question about the uh, microwave backscatter results from the sea clutter, and he's wondering if it indicates, in general, that the HH returns are higher than the VV returns for low grazing angles, which may explain uh, the areas seen in just offshore uh, stuff in, the, in your presentation. And you can look at that camera when you answer that one straight ahead there. Oh, straight ahead. Yeah. Okay. Don, you want to take that one? <laughs> well, I, I don't feel very knowledgeable to answer yeah. this question, but uh, it's entirely possible that uh, the, the vertical dimension of, of the sea spray might have some characteristic that allows it to be uh, a larger dimension than we would expect for most precipitation size drops. Also possible that these are very small drops and the wind literally rips them apart, which could, cr could create different shapes than we're accustomed mm -hmm. to seeing. But in the end, I'm afraid that I cannot easily answer the question posed. Maybe, Paul, you can take a shot at it. Right, and just, just because we've seen negative ZDR, significantly negative differential reflectivity, associated with these signatures offshore, either, either the west coast or the east coast, suggests that yes, the, the vertical channel for some reason dominates the horizontal reflectivity. But as to why, you know, that's, uh, research is gonna have to find or understand 
better how that how that might come about. Hi guys, this is Jennifer Ocavina, the Chief Met at WPSD in Paducah, Kentucky, and I have a viewer question from Justin Adams, who works with International Emergency Management in the energy sector. And his question is, with dual pole radar, do they think it will reduce false positives on warnings, uh, on warning TDS cells, giving Metro a better view of the storm? Well, if, if we're talking about reducing false alarms in tornado warnings, I don't think that yeah. at least initially dual pole is going to have a strong input to be able to do that because the dual pole signatures we're seeing for tornadoes occur after formation. We want to issue that warning well mm -hmm. before the tornado forms to give people uh, time to take shelter. So we're going to continue to have to use the tools that we currently have now, radar data, velocity data, seeing the circulation form within the cloud, and spotter reports that conditions are getting right for tornadoes, uh, and try to anticipate the time of tornado formation. Yeah, and where, where it'll also help is people further down the path. So, in other words, the tornado warning goes out based on the normal reflectivity and velocity signatures. When uh, later on, if we see debris form with that particular signature, people further down the path, we're able to give them that message that, hey, this is, this is a damaging, it's confirmed tornado. Uh, you know, immediate action is required. It's a much stronger statement than just saying, we think there's a tornado in there, or tornado's possible. Um, and so just to further conversation, I don't have any other viewer questions, but for the conversation itself, and I think taking away from today is um, one of the benefits to this upgrade is certainly seeing a better confirmation, if you will, that there is a serious threat as opposed to, well, this storm hasn't produced anything significant yet, so that might cut down on TV time, interruptions, and that sort of thing, but also um, verifying, especially overnight when you don't have spotters, that can verify for you that there may be debris and possibly a tornado on the ground. Um, also, in a lot of different areas, you've got in the wintertime regions that are on that rain, sleet, snow line. Um, discuss a little bit with me how this advances uh, determining when that switches over and how it may give a little bit of lead time as to where snow banding may set up. Right, so with current radar technology, uh, what we call reflectivity. That's what you see on, on uh, television all the time. It's the, the greens, the yellows, the reds. With that technology, the older technology, we're only able to tell whether precipitation is increasing or is heavy. But we are unable to discern with that radar whether it's rain, whether it's snow, whether it's a mixture of precipitation. With dual polarization technology, we have the ability to identify where it's rain and where it's snow and then track that particularly if you're close to the radar, i.e. In, in a major metro area near a radar site, we're able to track where that transition zone occurs. And so every five minutes, we're getting an updated position on where it, it's going from rain to snow or maybe even to sleep. And then that'll give, that can give a heads up to people who are traveling, to airports, to road crews who need to treat the streets so that they know when things change over to snow. So a lot, a lot of neat things that are coming with dual polarization in terms of winter weather. Do you want to also discuss some of the drawbacks, some things that just quite aren't there yet? I know, Don, you were discussing a few of those things and how this is still in a, an infant stage and that this is all new technology and there are things to work out. Yes, we're, we're still uh, working on basic issues with the radar. Calibration is very important. And we, with, like with any new technology, we have to work on uh, getting all of the calibrations right and, and uh, getting all the radars tuned. And so we're still at work on that. Uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about, a lot of things that Paul has talked about, we can get from the variables themselves, a lot of important information. But some additional information, for instance, uh, precipitation accumulation estimates, we need some algorithms to help us. And we're working on uh, finishing and maturing those algorithms so that they give the right answer a vast majority of the time. Paul, this is uh, Dave Jones. I have one question that I wanted to uh, pose uh, to you, and that is how does the, the dual polarization, or the dual pole Doppler radars fit into the overall um, initiative of the Weather Ready Nation from the National Weather Service? Right, so with the Weather Ready Nation, we're trying to prepare or help our customers make better decisions. 
we're empowering them with, with information and more accurate um, data at their fingertips that then they can use and make the, make the decisions that need to pre prevent or protect lives and livelihoods. With dual polarization technology, that's one of the tools available to National Weather Service forecasters that mainly will increase forecaster confidence in the things that they're seeing on radar, which how, how that helps is it translates into more accurate products, more confidence in the products that they are issuing to the American public and, and all of our partners. And so it, it, it piggybacks on with a broadcast meteorologist where if we're, if, we're, if we're adding more confidence to our products, then they see that confidence and they can translate it into a much stronger message uh, to their viewers. And so for Weather Ready Nation, it's all about um, you know, empowering people to make better decisions, have better data at their fingertips to make those decisions. We're going to increase communication, mm -hmm. and that's always going to be useful. And it will help to make us all weather ready. Weather ready. Mm -hmm. Um, Don, just out of my interest too, I know if I, th I think I'm right in that you used for the first time dual pole in some of the vortex and on Doppler on wheels. Is that right? Is that how this was kind of born? Well, several of our mobile radars had dual polarization, but actually it's been in research for fixed base radars for 20 years now, 20 to 25 years. So we've transferred it to mobile radars, but the first applications were fixed base radar. And what are some of the successes that you had in the Vortex project? Um, maybe some of the realizations, um, some of the data that came back that was successful for you? Well, we've learned with these uh, mobile radars, dual polarization equipped. Now these are uh, X-band and C-band, three centimeter and five centimeter wavelengths. And they have a couple of additional issues we have to work through, like attenuation, uh, we are working through those issues, but we've learned with those radars up close to the storm, we can see a lot of detail, even more detail in the debris signature that Paul and I talked about, and more detail about the distribution of precipitation particles, drop sizes, and hail. And in Vortex 2 in particular, we had uh, mobile mesonet teams driving up underneath the storm, driving into the hail, so we had very good verification on the hail data, and uh, gives us even more confidence in dual polarization that it's working correctly when we get such good verification data. So are, are we going to see any uh, more uh, Vortex, uh, maybe a Vortex 3? Is that uh, coming up anytime soon? I'm sure you're going to see a Vortex 3, but not anytime soon for a couple of reasons. First, big experiments are expensive and for our part of the severe storm community can probably only be afforded about once a decade such was the case between Vortex 1, Vortex 2. I anticipate that for Vortex 3. Second reason it still needs to be a while is uh, good money was paid to collect a lot of data and we need to analyze, go through that data and learn from that data before we go out and collect more data. So we might have smaller, more focused efforts in upcoming years, but I don't think you're going to see a Vortex 3 for quite a few years yet. We're just checking for any more online questions. So those of you that are watching, if you have any other questions, uh, please submit them now. And uh, we can pose them to uh, Paul and or Don. We'll give it another minute or two and okay. see if anybody has a All right, we can do that. Uh, my background is uh, severe storms, many years at the National Severe Storms Laboratory, uh, research, uh, radar. I was fortunate enough to be involved in the development of Doppler radar and NextRad and have been able to continue that over time. I've had some involvement with uh, training, uh, some involvement with uh, the administrative parts of this and the management uh, program. But I'm now retired from the federal government working for the University of Oklahoma, a cooperative institute back with NOAA and uh, trying to, again, work on the research side. And so <coughs> my, my specialty was in radar meteorology as well, but more, uh, I was in training in the National Weather Service for the past eight years. And so my focus was taking the interpretation of radar data and how that would translate into benefits 
or better, more accurate forecasts and warnings from the National Weather Service. So I did that for the past eight years. I loved doing it. I made a career change just in April. Now I'm an executive advisor for the director of the National Weather Service, Jack Hayes. And he's been using me for severe weather, for radar, just developing policy and helping him understand uh, the intricacies that are involved with severe weather warnings, and especially given the 2011 that we all had, right, with uh, the severe weather and the tornadoes and, and that kind of thing. So it was a good year for me to be uh, downtown as an advisor. Uh, Dave, I was going to comment that, that I might answer a question that was posed this morning and one to which I didn't know the answer when it was posed by some of the people in the audience. And that question concerned the Ridge software. This Ridge software is used by the Weather Service on their websites to display uh, radar data from the WSR-88Ds. And many people have seen it on those websites. The question was, when will the Ridge be updated to include dual polarization outputs? And I was able to research, find the answer, and the plan is for that upgrade, but not until all of the sites have been implemented. So we're perhaps a year or a little more away from that upgrade right now. I do have one follow-up question to that, uh, Don, and, that, and perhaps Paul, too. When you see the, uh, the national mosaic of the radar, when you go to the Weather Service website and you see the national mosaic, uh, does that mean that um, dual-pole data won't make it into that national mosaic until all of the radars are together or, or, or dual-polarized? I, I think when you look at individual sites and the base data, you won't see dual-pole outputs. But when you look at the uh, regional reflectivity mosaics, dual polarization is already being used there as a background to, to edit and quality control so that we get precipitation outputs and not non-precipitation non outputs being displayed. So uh, oftentimes when you do look at the national mosaic of the radar, you do see a lot of um, you know, typically called ground clutter around those sites when the sun goes down, you have inversions, all that kind of stuff. Are you saying that the dual poles, when they come online, will be used to help minimize that? So we'll slowly see uh, those, um, those uh, you know, that ground clutter go away in the national mosaic? Yes. Over time, you, you will see that occur. Now, there's some software stages, and, and uh, this will be done in steps and increments, but there's already some being done now, and more will be done in the future. might point out that we're probably going to see two kinds of radar displays for the future. One that's just the precipitation, and many people want to see just that, but then we might also want to see displays that have the precipitation and the clear air data because there are boundaries in the clear air data, not precip, but thin lines with gust fronts and, uh, and other important features, and some users of the radar data want to see those as well. So I think we'll see two types of radar outputs. One, uh, one final question that relates to... Uh, when we had a weather and climate summit a couple of, a few years ago now, um, that I experienced personally, and that was when we were flying into uh, the steamboat area in northwest Colorado. Uh, we were at about 34,000 feet and encountered a uh, horizontal roll vortex uh, from a lee wave. Uh, it was a very strong surface winds in, in Boulder. They were experiencing 90 mile an hour winds at that time. Uh, we were um, flying at 34,000 feet. We dropped 9,800 feet in a minute, and then the, the pilot, you know, gunned the engines a little bit, and we went back up 10,000 feet uh, in, in less than a minute. Uh, there was a lot of screaming on the plane. <laughs> People didn't have their seatbelts on, and uh, it was, uh, you know, this clear air turbulence. And I'm wondering if uh, dual-pole radar or any technology that's coming up from the National Weather Service might help to detect that because the pilots were totally unaware. As a passenger and a meteorologist, I was looking out the window seeing these massive lenticular clouds, and I was like, told my family to put their seatbelts on. Uh, but uh, how do we address this kind of uh, issue? Well, I wouldn't, the radars themselves would be, it would be a tough job for them to be able to detect clear air turbulence. Just because for radars to detect anything and get a strong enough signal to, to create ac accurate or um, uh, good, good radar products, you need some, something, some strong scatterers. 
like raindrops or ice crystals or things like that. And a lot of times in clear air turbulence, that's just it. That's clear air. And so it, it, it's, it's a tough sell for radars to be able to detect that kind of stuff. But I don't know. Are there any other observation platforms that might help with that? Well, I don't know of anything particular in dual pole that's going to right. help. Yeah. And, and Paul's absolutely correct that the, the problem in the clear air is no scatterers. Mm -hmm. But there, uh, there are clear air returns close to the radar. And there are occasionally strong refractivity, uh, refractive index gradient changes, even in the middle part of the atmosphere, that maybe a little bit of that can be sensed. But actually, the better opportunity would be more advanced radar on board the aircraft, because their clear air return ahead of them should be, with a, with a properly configured radar, enough that they might be able to sense that. Yeah. Now, having said all that, one other thing, uh, one other plug I want to put in here is that we are about to implement a turbulence algorithm for the WSRID-8D, and those outputs will be coming in the next couple of years. Uh, again, with the caveats we've already said, can't see everything in the clear air, but it will take the spectrum width and other uh, inputs, and it will actually calculate the magnitude of the turbulence. That's terrific and very informative. And uh, we did have a note from one of the online viewers saying, please thank the speakers for coming back this afternoon because they're uh, really learning a lot. And we have quite a few people that are watching uh, right now. So uh, for those of you who uh, uh, just wanted to sit and listen, thank you for doing that. And thank you for your input and everything. Uh, Paul and uh, Don, thank you so much for coming back. And we hope uh, uh, that others tap into your expertise while you're here at the uh, Len Gerberg Weather and Climate Summit out here at Breckenridge. So uh, with that, uh, we will end this, uh, this first session, this test session of uh, uh, the first day of the Weather and Climate Summit, and we'll see you back here uh, for the same session with a few more speakers uh, tomorrow. And please join us uh, tomorrow morning as we uh, begin streaming once again with uh, Dale Eck uh, from the Weather Channel with his uh, daily weather briefing. That will start at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, tomorrow morning and these times are mountain standard time so please make your adjustments accordingly uh, and you see the schedule up there from 8:30 to 9:45 we'll have Dr. Greg Forbes from the Nash from the uh, Weather Channel and uh, his topic will be uh, the deadly 2011 severe weather and lessons learned then Bruce Thomas will join us from Midland Radio Bruce is a former television meteorologist who is now the uh, spokesperson for Midland Radio and uh, he's going to talk about the importance of having a NOAA weather radio, uh, especially with all the severe weather that we seem to be uh, that seems to be increasing around the country. Um, that's going to be a, a short presentation, about 15 minutes, and then we'll move on after a break to uh, Dan Leonard from WSI, who will talk about uh, seasonal forecasting. How is that possible? We've talked quite a bit about the challenges of short-term forecasting and using uh, dual-pole Doppler radar to really get uh, down into details. Uh, for a minute ahead to five minutes ahead and we're going to jump tomorrow afternoon in the second session to uh, seasonal forecasting. How can we uh, see what the weather is going to be like or the climate is going to be like uh, over the next uh, six months to maybe even a year. So that should be very interesting. And then we'll have those speakers back to join us for a live question and answer session from 1.30 to 2 o'clock. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Dave Jones with the Weather and Climate Summit. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Thank you for joining us.